meeting to order at 7.05 p.m. Let's go through roll call. Ms. Alfonso Wells. Present. Mr. Miser. Here. Mr. Price. Here. Ms. Salisbury. Here. Ms. Scales. Here. Ms. Stribling. Here. Mayor Schwartzwelder. Here. And I am likewise here. Let's move to um, item three on the agenda, public comment. Uh, our first public comment comes from Mary and Gib Miller to speak about the Hometown, Hometown Heroes program. Mayor and Gib, feel free to unmute and share. All right, thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Mary, this is Gib. Uh, we're here representing SEDCO. Uh, and SEDCO just wanted to talk to you real quick about uh, the Hometown Heroes veterans banners that we wanted. Uh, that we've started selling uh, to put up on Washington and Noble Street. Um, but before we start, I did want to just uh, say a quick thank you to the organizers of the Juneteenth uh, celebration. We did have a booth there and we were able to connect with a lot of people in Swissvale and a lot of people outside of Swissvale, which was surprising. It was probably half and half. And so we were able to promote Swissville as a great place to move to. So thank you for doing that. It was really fun and um, we hope you do it again next year. Um, so uh, as far as the better, veterans banners are going, so we are doing this as a fundraiser for the Swissville Library renovation to help it become ADA compliant um, because we've been writing letters of support for their grant applications. And one of the things that they, you know, are looking for is community buy-in to the project uh, for the renovation. So we're hoping this will kind of stir up some community support for the library and to get that project going and get their fundraising over the top. Uh, so the banners are going to sell for $200. We're donating half of the profits to the library. Um, and the other half is going to go to SEDCO projects that we're currently working on. Um, so we have talked to Mr. Batchy about um, the, the, the flagpole brackets that are on Washington and Noble, um, and he has agreed to have the DPW hang those for us so we know how many there are and how many banners we can sell. Uh, what we want to ask council is if we uh, put up the banners, we would like to leave them up for a year. Uh, at a minimum, and we don't want to, you know, have someone come and say, well, we wanted to put up a banner and now there's not a space because then we would have to pick and choose which veterans banners to take down. So we just didn't know if there was any other community groups or the borough or anyone who had a commitment to use those bracket spaces for the next year, starting at Veterans Day to Veterans Day. Uh, so we wanted to just run that by you and see if we can use all of them or if we can only use some of them or if there's a limitation on how long they can be up. So that was one thing. Uh, the other question we had was um, as part of our research and getting this up and running, we have talked to some of the members of the American Legion and they said that there was $1,500 that they gave to the borough when they, um, shut down a few years ago and that the money was earmarked for a project like this to honor veterans. So we didn't know what we had to do in order to get access to that money to use on their behalf to help to honor their service. So um, we would just like the council to look into, you know, what we would have to do to get the use of that money. Um, the third thing we wanted to ask in regards to this is on Veterans Day this year, we should have the banners up and we wanted to do some sort of a community celebration, which we don't know what it's going to look like yet. It may, we honestly don't know what we're going to be doing it, but we want to have some kind of a community celebration. And we just wanted to know if we could have borough support in facilitating that if we needed barricades set up or whatever we would need to do for that. So those were the three things that we had on that. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Um, uh, Mr. Batchy, perhaps um, 
we could offline after this meeting uh, at some point in time look into or brainstorm if there are any other um, community members or groups that typically use that and we can kind of pass a spread some of that information to council uh, as well as I know um, we've been talking about some creating some kind of policy for borough uh, sanction borough sponsored borough run events and, and and I think this would fit very well under that uh, the only other comment I want to make to that just because it, it, it's relevant to here is um, Ms. Miller this is uh, Tim Ward Mr. Ward had reached out to me a couple of weeks ago about that the, the funds from the Legion uh, I had Mr. Batchy look into it and uh, we, we have Kind of found the trail for that so uh, okay. when it needs to be released we are able to release that great okay so. thank you yeah wonderful well thank you very much for your comments and you we will uh, get back to you on some of those other items that you are asking about okay great thank you very much wonderful thank you mm -hmm. all right miss spoles uh, would like a bonnie spoles i uh, would like to speak about the department's dpw fire and police hi um this is going to be a two part, so I'll get you next week with the rest. It'd be nice if you'd acknowledge and forward forbid respond when we send complaints or requests to the borough website. It's frustrating when we're neither acknowledged nor responded to. We follow your rules and we get ignored. Please provide a reason why there's no response. My first question for the evening really is why are we working in other boroughs? The response that you get money is pathetic, short sighted, and a horrid way to support the borough. It's Swiss Vail's equipment that's being used, giving us a shorter usable life on the equipment. If Shell Fund is, is, is Shell Fund paying plant replacement or insurance on that? No, they're not. So even more expense will fall on the borough sooner or later. Liability if, it insure, if it, an employee is harmed? Swiss Vail. Look around Swiss Vail. We look like a developing nation at that. We can use the time and employees to repair and maintain our borough instead of working in others. If we don't need employees to work in Swiss Vale, if you think we have more than enough employees that we can sub them out to other places, I suggest we remove them from the payroll and save all that money from our budget. Honestly, you can't just throw money at a problem and getting little money from Shell Fund when we lose manpower and hours of work in our own borough is criminal. Wear and tear on our equipment is no joke. I did this stuff. You barely maintain Swiss Vale except for a few streets now and then when Greg said, he felt like it. He did say that and he didn't have a list, not by the need. If the borough solicitor is so lax in their response and so comfortable in a position where they do little or nothing, perhaps it's time to look for new representation. If Woodland Hills can do it, Swissville needs to audit and look at new representation as well. We want to be a forward looking borough. Using archaic legal representation will never get us there. If you always do what you always did, you're always gonna get what you always got. My second point is we need departments to work with each other to make Swiss Vail livable and remove some of the ridiculous walls that they set up for themselves. If the borough departments don't play as a team with fair and reasonably priced services to the residents, we will continue to fail. Infrastructure is the most important part of the borough and serves the community. If the police were policing the entire borough, you know, every street because that's where the residents live and find something that DPW or the borough needs attention these items should be addressed in meetings or once weekly in an email or some written format. A copy should go to the borough manager and council to ensure that the infrastructure work is noted and completed. It should be part of the DPW report to the borough at monthly council meetings. This way we're not wasting resources and protecting our little fiefdoms at the expense of residents and our tax dollars. And my third point is carry furnace should not be, it should be, not be up for public discussion. Really, I, we need to talk about this. It's, is this gonna be a subdivision for the rich, more apartheid for Swiss Vail? It, really, we need public discussion on this. And to final, I'd like to follow some examples of successful boroughs instead of letting ours continue down this horrible path that we've been on for decades. Millville Borough is an example of a successful borough. Both Aetna and Millville have green community certifications recognized by the state. We are welcome to borrow liberally from the Swissville, uh, from the Millville code. It's all on their website. You don't have to start everything from scratch. And good legal representation would be very, very helpful in this respect. And I don't think we're getting it. Anyway, those are my comments this week. Stay tuned next week for part two. Thank you, Ms. Foles. Um, 
there were a number of comments specifically uh, to DPW, so Mr. Batchy went it just to remind that uh, as these public comments come in, if department heads can be jotting notes so that they can respond to them uh, in the meeting. Uh, and if, uh, if it is something that cannot be responded to in the meeting, if they could please follow up with Ms. Foles um, offline uh, as well so that she does get the response that she is looking for. Um, in particular, Mr. Batchy, I know one of our items is to talk about uh, the uh, Carrie Furness, if um, there's any comments with regard to what she had shared in there uh, that are appropriate as part of that conversation, let's loop back to that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Foles. Okay, let's turn to a presentation from, uh, I was going to say Mr., but your, your uh, nameplate says Dr. Dr. Brian Bonsteel from the Humane Action Pittsburgh uh, regarding a pollinator project. You're muted right now, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bonsteel. There you go. I, I uh, don't have a doctorate in technology. There you go. Uh, I'm Brian Bonsteel, and I wanted to say hi to my friend, uh, Robert McTiernan. I wasn't expecting to see you, but what a pleasure. Um, I represent a group called Humane Action Pittsburgh that I'm president and founder of. And we are a group that has uh, advanced animal protection with legislative action, um, education, and public policy. Um, we have made it our mission to take on the most egregious animal uh, issues in our region and have, uh, in doing so, been able to help pass 17 laws uh, in the area that have really um, uh, helped our, our region become a much more humane place to be. Uh, some of the issues that we've got going on uh, in our region is uh, looking at how our habitats affect animals and therefore affect us. When we end up um, losing our habitats, we end up losing the species that go with it. Likewise, when we lose those species, we end up losing our habitats. And this all comes down to, uh, uh, to, to affect humans in the end. So um, one of the things that we want to do uh, is to look at regenerating um, the population of bees. They are now on the endangered species list. It is something that if we don't uh, curb uh, the, the trend, um, bees could possibly be going extinct. If they do, our food supply will diminish. And um, so for that reason, we'd like to have a pollinator garden uh, installed in Swissvale. And we've been working with Councilwoman Salisbury on this, who has helped us find a lot that could be cleaned up and made into an example for the Pittsburgh region. <clears throat> and um, we're excited about this for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, if you can envision the idea that there would be a beautiful place to go with flowers and pollinating uh, plants and bushes, people could come look at this and maybe have a sign that has a QR code to it where they could find out what those plants are and see them in person. Uh, they could do this in their own yard, but we could point to Swissvale as a, a leader uh, in this kind of, um, you know, regenerative project. Um, you would also have a bee hotel installed on the lot in which bees could live and propagate. And, um, and again, this is set up as an example, but it actually is a space where you start to have these animals flourish. So we just think that, um, you know, coming to Swiss Vail is a for, as a forward thinking community um, would be a great place to, um, to have this. And um, I understand the lot is next to Arby's. Um, uh, if that gives you some idea of where we're, we're looking to go. Um, it would be funded with a, uh, a batch of funds um, coming from different uh, sources, and we can provide a proposal to that as things start to uh, flesh out here. But um, we're excited to uh, work with Swiss Vale on this as a progressive community. Uh, we love your sh shade tree program, and I uh, want to congratulate everybody on that. That's something we might talk about working together with down the road. Um, but uh, that's kind of the skinny on that. And if there's any questions, I'm glad to answer them while I'm here. Are there any questions from council for Dr. Bonsteel? Dr. Bonsteel is also my dentist. So if you have any dental related questions, you may wish to hold those for a different time. Sounds good. Yeah, yes, I, I actually had a question about um, some of the uh, native uh, like trees that you would think or a native fruiting tree that you were thinking of putting on that site, which would be the pawpaw. How many pawpaws would you put on there? And um, what, 
would they be able to fruit? Ah, well, we have a master gardener working on that and I haven't seen the plans. The, the plans are not finalized for that, but someone is sketching this out and um, um, I don't have an answer for that at this point, but um, uh, you know, can, can I ask where you're going with that? Are you looking to have fruit trees on this? Is that what you're thinking? Well, I just like the idea of having indigenous um, native plants uh, to the area. And that's one that is, I mean, delicious. And it's a, it's a place that you could bring the kids. They could pick the fruit and then they could, um, you know, make a treat from it or something like that. So I always like to think of extra things that they can do to enjoy oh, nature. And so I love the idea, a food forest, if you will. Um, and in fact, um, that is actually something um, it's considered a polyculture. Um, to have bushes and, and plants that have nuts and fruits that feed humans, uh, as well as help uh, bees, you know, propagate. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that would be a great thing to have too. And um, uh, I mean, again, as, as, the, as the plan gets fleshed out, we'll certainly share it with council, but I would love it to be a very hands-on interactive place. And uh, if you can take fresh fruit and take it home with you, I think that will tell the story greater than anything. You know, I think kids um, only at this point believe that food comes from a grocery store. Um, if they can find out they could really grow it in their own backyard, um, I think then the whole project will be successful. So um, yeah, I, I'm all for it. I don't know how many pawpaw trees there will be. I, I, I haven't seen the lots up close yet, so I'm not quite sure how big this is. It's my estimation it's about a third of an acre. So there will be plenty of room for bees in one area. We don't want to, you know, have them going everywhere. Um, and then uh, certainly um, uh, fruit trees and flowers and um, some benches maybe where people can stroll and stop and enjoy this area. Um, but we really do want it to be a demonstration garden where people can come and learn from this. And um, I'm hoping that if it starts in Swissvale, we can see this go to more communities as a, an eco-friendly project. I'll, I'll pass this uh, idea of the papa tree along for you. Uh, thank you. And I really like the idea of having benches because I think that there are too many spaces um, that we do have that people can't really sit down there and enjoy. So I like that idea that you, you could go sit down, look at the pawpaws and what, well, hopefully not get stung by a bee. That right, be right. Counter, uh, productive, but yes, <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I was going to add also, we had talked about service berries when I was talking to some folks from your organization, because um, I think they're also called June berries, but I know people in Swiss Vale seem like they just love service berries. We had a recent event that someone organized online, um, and I'm so sorry because they're probably watching and I've totally forgotten who organized this event. Um, but people were doing service berry picking and then going to everyone's beloved Dairy Delight to put service berries on the ice cream and eat them. And I was definitely gonna go. And then I realized my neighbor has a service berry tree and I just thought it was one of those ornamental trees that is just there with weird berries on it. And I took a picture with my app on my phone and I realized that's actually a service berry tree. And I've lived here for seven years and never knew that. So that was helpful to know. It sounds like we need a garden to tell everybody that. <laughs> Uh, it, doc, Dr. Bonsill, how long has Humane Action Pittsburgh uh, been in operation? Uh, we are now in our eighth year and um, uh, we are based all over Pittsburgh. We don't have an office. We operate out of our houses. We, we run pretty much on a shoestring budget and um, uh, we have various campaigns. One is called Ending Canine Cruelty. Um, we have another one called Love Your Wild Neighbor, looking at the wild a wonderful Pennsylvania and all the uh, animal residents in that. We are kind of noted for um, banning the bull hook, which has prevented the circus from coming to town and brutalizing animals the way that it does. And uh, have been working closely with the zoo to restore AZA accreditation. This is the gold standard, keep in mind minimal standards, um, but uh, the zoo had um, had slipped from that mark and uh, we've been working uh, closely with them to bring it up and we're glad to say that's making good progress so um 
and the other thing too that we've been really working on is a compassionate living program, which has helped with food policy in schools uh, to have better, healthy, more organic food, but um, certainly um, more plant-based. And um, uh, yeah, so to answer your question, eight years, we're, we're into our eighth year at this point. Um, now, I know you've mentioned that Swiss Bell would be the leader of this program. So has Humane Action Pittsburgh ever, ever done this program at all within the eight years? The, the program that we're talking about is called Hap Hive, and it's a new one for us. And we, we were about a year into it as far as putting some thought together behind it. And uh, initially it was, it was a, a much smaller program in which we were going to in small, small B hotels all over the city and see if we could you know, put them in remote places. And it's kind of blossomed into the idea of becoming an interactive uh, place where um, you know, kids of all ages <laughs> can learn how to appreciate the, the beauty that we have here in Pennsylvania and, and how to, tr to you know, uh, produce food uh, in our own yards. Um, we certainly have to get our bee population back because we're declining at a rapid rate. Um, you know, along those lines too, it's important to know that in the last 50 years in my lifetime, birds in North America have decreased by 29%. Wildlife across the world has disappeared by, uh, at, by 60%. You know, we're not doing very well <laughs> as a planet this way, but to have bees on the endangered species list, that's a problem. That's a big one. So, um, no, we haven't done this program program yet, but uh, seeing the importance of it, um, we said we would like to do it in a place that is progressive and that has support. And in talking with Councilwoman Salisbury, um, the ideas just started to flow. And we're thinking that, you know, to do it, to have the first one, we would really like it to be a showpiece, you know, something where this sets the standard. This is what innovation looks like. And so it's called the HAP Hive program? Uh, Humane Action Pittsburgh HAP Hive program. And um, I'm not sure that that would be the name of the park necessarily, um, but um, it would, you know, that, that that is the program that we're looking at, HAP Hive. Okay. Being that it is, it's fairly new, um, do you, do you guys have maybe an estimate in terms of what the cost would be to start it and maintain it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'll have more on that to deliver probably within the month uh, where we're going. You know, a lot of this right now, as I understand, that particular lot has a lot of gravel on it and would need some topsoil, which I believe is going to be delivered by Public Works. I'm not sure. Um, so uh, I'm kind of coming at you a little bit early on some of these details, but we're going to have a budget proposed um, soon and how, how all this will be financed and of course maintained. Um, the grass isn't something to be mowed. We're planning on clover, which would just be something that can be, you know, let go. And um, uh, it, 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 as, as things go, it's going to be perennial plants and not necessarily a lot of... Uh, work to maintain it it's we're going to let nature do what it needs to do for the most part now we have um some gardeners here in swissville and we we actually have some native species gardeners as well and i do know we have a bee gardener as well because we had to change our ordinance uh so that she could continue her work with bees okay Does the, program have a plan to incorporate uh, com community and the use of our, our residents who want to be a part? Well, with, um, very much. We really want to bring in a lot of students from around uh, the city uh, to, to get hands on I and mean, to actually plant the plants and, get, and feel that they're a part of it. We'd like to have it become a media event. Uh, if you have in Swissvale a bee yeah, is she a beekeeper, this person? I don't know if she's bee. I don't want to say the wrong title. I understand. But she definitely houses and keeps bees. Okay. Um, we had to change our ordinance to make sure that she could continue to do what, what she's doing. Sure. Um, but then I also found out that we have a couple 
native species gardeners as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're aware, we have a community garden garden in Swissfell as well that has flowers, but also edibles, um, edible fruits and vegetables that are free to the community. And uh -huh. we also have coming up a, a edible garden tour that incorporates members of the community have, that have gardens that, that are growing in their, their, their backyards, basically. Oh, I'd love to work together with all of these people. They sound great, you know. And I mean, I, this is the idea that no one person owns this garden, that it really belongs to everybody and, and not just to, to visit, but, you know, to partake in the design and the upkeep and um, the enjoyment of it. So um, if you can maybe connect me with them, I'd like to have, I'd like to hear their input. If I can jump in about costs too, because I had asked Mr. Batchy about this before, because I drive by this all the time. Um, and so to me, it's just sort of the random gravel lot that always grinds at the back of my brain. And I hoped that we could turn it into a parklet for a long time. So some months ago, I had asked Mr. Batchy how much it would cost just to put topsoil and grass on it because I wasn't really thinking about all of this like native plant sustainability. So I, my mind was just kind of, let's make it green instead of gravel. And so Mr. Batchy had said, we're looking at somewhere between four and $6,000 to acquire the topsoil for it because it is a substantial lot and um, to plant it with grass. And then of course there'd be ongoing maintenance because DPW would have to mow it. So this would be a savings to the borough because this organization is willing to do, um, you know, take the, spearheading of the uh, fundraising aspect of it. And then when, because it would be planted with non-mowing required um, plants, then we would save DPW hours on that. So I just wanted to jump in because I had already asked Mr. Bachi about that. So Dr. Bonsteel, a question that I have is, I know you guys have been operating eight, for eight years and you're not for profit. Do you guys have any sort of DEI policy or focus? We do. We absolutely do. And uh, that's important to us. We've um, <clears throat> actually reached out to um, a, a group called CARE, hoping to expand um, a more diverse board. As, as we've grown into a nonprofit, uh, we would like to see a much more diverse board. And, uh, and we have a D, uh, DEI policy. I'm glad to provide you with a copy of that. Okay. Thank it's very you. important to us. Thank you so much. Now, outside of speaking with Ms. Salisbury, is there anything else that that gauged your attraction to Swissvale for this project? Um, I have friends in Swissvale, um, so I enjoy coming through it. Um, and uh, uh, and then as and pretty much as we've talked with the councilwoman. Um, uh, we've just we've just really struck up more of a conversation that, that steered it towards Swiss Rail. We've we've talked with different communities and we didn't get that um, that buy in right away. Honestly, we felt the warmest welcome coming from Swiss Rail. So um, that's where we wanted to concentrate our energy. Um, we're very excited about it. Thank you so much for answering my plethora of questions, but oh. I. My husband is the gardener in my family. <laughs> so oh. my extent of gardening was a Google search and talking to the fellow gardeners in Swissville. And so <laughs> I have questions just because I'm, I'm actually interested. I, I, I want to inform myself so I can make an informed decision. Well, I made some notes here and um, uh, I very much would be, I'd uh, like to talk with your gardeners um, who specialize in native species. And, um, and, and we'll, we'll talk more about the community garden. So um, I'll bring this back and um, if I can get some better answers for you, um, maybe we can talk again and um, share them with everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonsteel, for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Ms. Salisbury, for bringing it to our attention, uh, this, this organization relationship. And we'll, we'll hit pause on this conversation now because uh, item H under our agenda items is to have some further discussion as council about this. So um, again, thank you, Dr. Bonsteel for your time. And- um, Thank you. You're welcome. Let's move on to our agenda items. So a, agenda um, number four, agenda items, um, agenda item A is discuss adoption 
of an ordinance to increase the fine for illegal parking in a designated handicapped parking space from $50 to $100. The police so committee. Yep, go ahead. Sorry. No, the I was going to ask if you wanted to, or if uh, Ms. Scales' police committee wanted to, to run point on that. So, Ms. Ms. Scales, do you want, or do you want me to? Oh, sure. And you can fill, a, fill in the gaps because you take, you have better notes than me. <laughs> Uh, so this has been an ongoing discussion for the police committee for quite some time. Um, it has been brought to our attention, but we also notice ourselves um, continuous violations of the handicapped parking spaces, and we wanted to figure out what can we do to deter it. We understand that people are going to do what they want to do. And some folks are just going to ignore it, but we we wanted to work on how can we deter it. So what has been done is first an inventory on who actually is still using the designated handicap spaces um, and to make sure that the designated handicap spaces are currently actually being used by individuals who still live in Swissville or are still handicapped. Um, another thing that has been worked on is the painting of the handicap lines as well. And so we also wanted to determine from an ordinance standpoint, what changes can we make as well to further push the point that we want to deter. And so the committee had the opportunity to review some research that chief Watson actually provided to us in terms of what are the fines um, that are issued around neighboring uh, boroughs and municipalities. And also we were able to look and see in terms of, you know, if everyone is towing or not towing. And so ultimately we determined that what we'd like to do is to increase the fine from $50 to $100. Now, our police, they are, in general now, when they detail, they are checking to see, you know, in terms of who is violating, and they are enforcing. Um, and if anyone calls and reports a violator, they also are enforcing as well. But to further push the point that we want to deter, we've decided that it's best to increase the fine from $50 to $100. We're not trying to get rich. We just want people not to park in the handicapped spaces that are designated for people who actually need that space. Thank you, Ms. Scales. Um, Mr. Batcher, do you have anything to add to that? Just, just to mention that Mr. McTiernan's office drafted the ordinance and the ordinance has been properly advertised and can be adopted at any at any subsequent meeting. So if you want to adopt it next week, we are uh, we can do so. Great, thanks. So I know the police committee uh, is on board with this. They have talked about this uh, even over a year ago when I was still on the police committee, we talked about this. So I know this has been a long time coming. Uh, are there any other members who are not on the police committee that have any questions uh, or want to chime in about this, uh, this agenda item? Okay, let's move on to agenda item B. Uh, discuss action on a resolution to renew the agreement between Swissville Borough and the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation for grass mowing along the Parkway East on ramp at Monongahela Avenue. So Mr. Batchy, I believe this would be you. Thank you. Um, the, the borough has for many, many years been mowing that area along Monongahela Avenue. Uh, at the Parkway and PennDOT pays us 36. They are, their rate for the next three years is $3,605.36. Um, over the last few years, this paid for the tractor that we purchased new in 2015 uh, in order to do this, but we also do many other properties with that tractor. It was about $20,000. So it's a, it's, a, it's a value to us to do it because it doesn't take a lot of time um, they only require that it be done twice a year, once in July and October. We do it a little bit more because if we wait till July, it'll be four feet high and we can't, it'd be difficult to do. Um, but it's, there's value in it for us in, in, the, in, the, um, in the funds we receive from PennDOT for doing it. And it's up for, the, it, it expires July 1st. So they're asking us to renew it if we wish, if we could wish to continue to do it. Any comments or questions about that? I just wanted to, so you said 
it, it's only required to be done twice, but we're doing it more. How roughly how often are we mowing that area? About once a month. Once a month. And how long does it take? A couple hours. A couple hours. Okay. All right. Was just curious kind of what the man hour <laughs> right. usage was. So, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if you answered this question already, Greg. How much are they paying us? $3,605.36. Is that a year? A year, yeah. So over the three-year term of this contract, it's about a little under $11,000. How much do we pay hourly for someone to, to mow the grass? Uh, around $20. Well, the the full-time people, $20.71. But uh, so in the summertime, we use one or two full-timers and then a few summer help, um, you know, the, to do the weed whacking around there. So um, you're looking, you know, $12 for summer help, 36, 56, 60, you know, 76. You're looking probably with, with overhead $90 an hour. Um, to do it and we spend two to three hours there probably five times a year so there's a I mean there is a profit involved okay that's what I was trying to do and it's the end of the day so my math is not mathing right now mm -hmm. so I was trying to figure out you know are we getting paid enough to cover you know what the hourly, hourly rate would be and are we getting paid enough that you know if there's any sort of maintenance that needs to take place or replace over a uh, replacement of a, a a lawn mower mm. that's all covered basically in that fee yeah i wouldn't recommend we do it if it wasn't gotcha miss salisbury is there any chance i see sometimes along the freeway that some places put wildflowers and stuff instead of grass so that we don't have to mow it is there any chance we can con them into doing something like that instead of paying us money to mow it and then we can have our dpw folks spend money or spend time on other things I could, I could discuss it with them, but there would still be some mowing involved there, whether we do it or they do it, um, you know, to, uh, to, you know, to continue, you know, to keep it up. Okay. I'm just curious. It's something I've seen along the freeways sometimes and it looks pretty in the summer. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Any other comments or questions? Sounds good. And I think to Ms. Salisbury point, it's worth an ask. Doesn't hurt. The worst they can say is no, and we just keep things up the way they are. Um, okay, let's move on to item three, discuss approving a subdivision of land owned by the Redevelopment Authority of Allegheny County along Cary Furnace Boulevard as recommended by the Planning Commission with the conditions recommended. The Planning Commission met last week on Thursday to discuss this, this proposed subdivision. Um, a representative from Allegheny County was present along with the engineer who designed the plan. Uh, basically, all it is is a subdivision of land. There's no development proposed at this time. The subdivision is to create a 20-acre parcel for Rivers of Steel to have, along with the um, Cary Furnace buildings that are still there, it would clearly define and delineate what property actually is under the control of Rivers of Steel. We asked the question if they were selling this to Rivers of Steel or leasing it under a long-term lease, and the answer was they weren't sure. They, they hadn't made a decision on that yet. But in order to develop the rest of the property, they want to remove this property from it um, because there are development plans with RIDC currently. They're working with the Pittsburgh Movie Office to create some movie studios down there and also some office area. So this can this is can respond to part of Ms. Ms. Spoll's comment about you know what's going on down there. It's you know it's going to be a an office and industrial area. There's no this isn't for um um, for housing or for, you know, for, for um, riverfront housing or riverfront condominiums or anything. It's all, it's all light industrial warehousing offices, stuff like that, or the things that they're looking to put in there. Um, but so they want to, they want to create this 20 acre parcel. Now um, we had, we did have some concerns with the creation of the parcel because basically they're landlocking. If, if you've ever been down there, there's a, a railroad track, that's elevated that goes around to the Monongahela River. And there's a tunnel underneath the railroad track that provides access to three more parcels owned, owned by Allegheny County. They've done two things, which is put a lot of a debris underneath that tunnel so it can't be driven under. And they've also, um, they've also put several gates up there so we cannot access, no one can access it, including the borough. But if somebody's back there riding a quad or, you know, 
doing something that they shouldn't be doing, but have an accident, we can't get in there with a, an ambulance, fire truck, or any, you know, even a police car uh, to provide any kind of aid to them. So what we've asked of them are three things. One, that they delineate right away along the entire parcel so that it gives us legal right to access it. That's the first one. Number two, that they provide a, a, um, uh, a Knox lock, which sets like a Knox box that are on the commercial buildings that keys with our, our Knox boxes so that any fire, ambulance, or police officer could get into that set. We already have a key into that area and that they remove the debris from underneath the tunnel. They've agreed to all three of those conditions. So um, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the subdivision with the conditions and I would concur with that. You know, there's there's no there's no legal reason that you can deny it because they meet the criteria of the zoning ordinance. So this is one of those you have to approve. If you don't, it'll become a deemed approval in 90 days. Um, so I would recommend you approve it with those conditions, um, which they are uh, amenable to. Great, thanks, Mr. Batchy. I know that there a number of years ago, even before I was on council, there was conversations about this and the industrial park that you talked about, which uh, it sounds like the vast majority or all of that industrial park is in Rankin. Looking at the schematics that you sent over to us, it looks like the Rivers of Steel carry furnace area that would be the subdivision. To the west of that, uh, along the Monongahela, there is an empty parcel that I imagine would be all in Swissvale. Uh, it, have there been any plans for that parcel uh, to be developed or is it still going to continue to just kind of sit idle? That'll be a later stage of development because there's no, there's not even a road there yet. Um, you have Cary Furnace Boulevard, which comes up to the old Cary Furnace, all that land in front there, the 60 or so acres in Rankin is available for development. The other 15 in, in Swissville, um, there's the, um, the water line, sanitary sewer lines and storm sewer lines are there, but the road itself is not there. Um, so that would be a later phase. Now the, um, representative from Allegheny County who was there last week, she did indicate that if somebody came to them with a develop, you know, with a development plan that meets their criteria for that site, um, you know, they would entertain by leasing or selling that property to them at this time. So does the right of way conversation that we're having provide uh, us to make a right to build a road there so that it can be accessed and not landlocked? Is that part of why we're doing this? No, we're not building a road. We're asking for the right of way so we have acts have legal access to it. Okay. Um, eventually, they will dedicate a right of way when they develop the property, um, but we're asking for them to to dedicate that now on the plans. Okay, so that's we're put. I'm putting the cart before the horse in terms of uh, thinking at all of access to that plot of land until yeah. when it becomes developed. Allegheny County will determine the best way to develop and yeah. access yeah. it. And okay. we will not build a road at all. That would okay. be Allegheny County, or they may pass it on to somebody who comes in and develops the property. Great, thank you for that clarification. Sure. Ms. Salisbury. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of sort of context information. Um, I know uh, Mayor Schwarzwelder was at this meeting because I saw the back of her head on the Zoom, um, but there was a meeting about economic development plans for that broader space down there. And um, I have to say, I was a little bit disappointed at the way that uh, it's been presented. It was basically described that there would be a uh, sort of a brain section, if you will, and then a manufacturing section, and we're not the brain section. <laughs> so the brain section is supposed to be sort of, um, you know, your startup -y area that's developed, maybe over towards CMU, East Liberty, you know, you see Google, Duolingo, that kind of stuff over there. And then the idea would be there'd be some light manufacturing perhaps over in our area. And that's kind of their future plans for what might be done with some of that space. Um, it's not really flattering in my mind. I, I typed in, you know, you can ask questions in the comments. And one of my questions was, why can't we be the thinking part? <laughs> why do we, why are we the manufacturing part only? Um, you know, why can't we do both things here? So to me, I am curious to see what happens because 
it did not seem to me that they've really put a lot of effort into talking to the community itself, the community members about what they would like to see down there, um, jobs that would be produced by that type of development. Are they a match for the kind of jobs that people in our area want to have? And I did receive a couple of comments from Swiss Vale residents that they felt that they were kind of being overlooked in favor of some expensive consultants being brought in and kind of giving a here's what's going to happen to your community because we know best kind of approach. So I wasn't super encouraged with what I've seen so far, but I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and because it still seems very, very broad strokes. I, um, I am also, uh, I don't know. I, I think that River of Steel should also be present in some of these conversations. We don't know, you know, what what is it, that, you know, does it benefit them or not benefit them to have um, uh, this access or to be cut off or, or whatever. I would like to hear from them to see where they're at with it. I mean, it might be something we're overlooking because I don't think we really have a lot of information um, about what's going on. I, I do know that um, uh, from what I saw that the idea is that uh, the tunnel would have to be cleaned out um, or that at least the wish is that the tunnel gets cleaned out. But one of my issues with that is if the tunnel gets cleaned out and you have more people that are able to just go on to that property, um, they could cause vandalism. So we'd wanna make sure that, uh, that people weren't just given free access, that something down there um, cuts that off so that they don't have free access to, to, to just go into that area. So I think that there are a, a lot of things that we need to actually consider. I don't feel comfortable um, the way it's just, uh, just right now, I would like some a little more input um, from some of the other players uh, that have a stake in this. Can I just interject? We're not talking about a development plan. We're talking about a subdivision plan to create a lot for Rivers of Steel. The What you're talking about is more of a development plan. At that point, yeah, we need to have a lot of input. But this is a, 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 this is a use by right down there. And they've met the criteria for the subdivision. And they've actually agreed to several conditions um, that would help us. And I believe there is a gate under the tunnel already, so it's not going to provide more access. It will provide the borough access for public safety to get into those other parcels when they put locks, you know, the, the Knox locks on the several gates and clean out under the tunnel, which allow us the access. So we can't hold up the subdivision. We're, we have no legal right to hold up the subdivision because of concerns about the future development. This is only a subdivision plan, and they, they can build nothing as a result of what we're talking about tonight. Oh, no, I, I understand that. I just wanted to see, um, you know, what Rivers of Steel perhaps thought about it since they're right there and, and the parcels being created for them. Um, yeah, they concur with it because this is, the, the county worked with them on this too to create the parcel for them. So they're fully supportive of it because this is going to be their parcel that they control now. And they have um, that they have the they know these are the boundaries of your parcel, and they actually expanded it about 120 feet into Rankin, um, going eastbound that they didn't have control over before. That sounds great. Is it possible that we can get um, Rivers of Steel to come to our next meeting? I I can't answer that. I mean, I can invite them, but I don't know if they'll come. Okay. Thank if we you. can invite them, that'd be great. That sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah, I just feel I'll like we're just missing them. Oh, sorry, Sean. Sorry, I just meant to say I'll also reach out to them and, and see if uh, they can come and answer any <laughs> weird questions we might have. Yeah, I just feel like there's a whole lot of information missing. Like I'm not easily connecting the dots. Um, and so my thought process is there's a whole lot missing that I should know about uh, that has an impact on Swissville. So if we could get them here, that would be perfect because I, I honestly feel like, Greg, there's a whole lot missing. There's nothing missing. This is a subdivision plan and they've met all the criteria for a subdivision of property. There's nothing missing from the subdivision. 
And this does not give them any right to do anything in the future other than record a, 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 develop, a record a subdivision plan and then lease that area or sell it to Rivers of Steel. So with the subdivision that's taking place, because they need they need us for this, right? They need yeah, the council has to, well, council has to approve it, but if council fails to act on it, it's deemed approval within 90 days. And if you if you act on it and deny it. And they, they can appeal it to common pleas court, and it probably will be overturned. And we'll have to incur a lot of legal fees because they met all the criteria of the subdivision ordinance. And at that point, it's a, it's you know you have you have to approve it. And they've agreed to some conditions that allow us to uh, allow us better access for um, for emergency services to get down there and provide you know provide. Um, services to people who may be injured or, or, or whatever happens there. I think, I mean, I think the other thing to keep in mind with this that sometimes can get confused is that we don't have any ownership or true oversight. And, and Mr. Batch, if I'm speaking out of turn or if I'm incorrect, please let me know. But this is not our land. It is in Swissvale, but it is owned by the county. And so the county has been working through its plans uh, of what to do with it and how to basically what they're doing is they're breaking it into chunks so that it can be uh, sold or leased to Rivers of Steel so that the other portion in Rankin can be developed uh, through their process. All we're doing is we're kind of, uh, we're not legislating anything. Uh, we are just giving approval. Um, I don't know the, the way, uh, I'm trying to think of a comparison uh, in terms of the business world. I'm having trouble finding one, but. Um, this is the same thing as if, if a, a homeowner came in if, if, if a homeowner came in and wanted to create a second lot to, you know, or, or if a homeowner had two lots and they wanted to combine them into one, um, we have the only thing we can do is make sure that it complies with subdivision re regulations. And if it does, it's required that it, that it be approved by the municipality. Um, it's just on a larger scale. It happens to be the county redevelopment authority owns the property, but rivers of steel basically controls a, about 20 acres now and they're they're basically formalizing that this is the area that rivers of steel can use so i don't disagree with i mean i see that this is just like a, a rubber stamping process i understand all, all i'm saying is that i would like to hear from them just like sometimes we'll hear from a homeowner that comes in and they'll say yes you know i will I, I will take care of that lot and then it'll go over and it'll go off of the taxpayers rolls. I know there's not really much uh, that we actually do with this, but I would just like to hear from them that that's all. Yeah, I can certainly reach out to them tomorrow and invite them to our next to next Wednesday's meetings. Not a, not a problem. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item D. Discuss adoption of a policy that would require vaccination against COVID-19 for all new employees. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who, if Mr. Batch, you want to do this. I don't know, Mr. Price, I know this is kind of your brainchild as well. Uh, who wants to take the lead on introducing this? Bill, do you want to? I, I'm unmuting myself. Uh, this would only apply to new hires. It would not affect anyone who is already employed with the borough but uh, it would uh, require anyone that's being hired uh, to uh, become vaccinated against uh, COVID. So I have a question, because I did read the, oh, I'm sorry, Bill, were you done? Because I don't want to cut you off. Okay. I did read the proposed policy. And so essentially we're asking folks to at least be have one shot at the very least and have proof of it and then they have so many days to to get the other vaccination shots once they're employed what i want to understand is because i know that we have union employees and rules and once they're an employee the the union then controls what can or cannot happen so once they're an employee for us, do they still have to comply with this policy? Well, um, to, can I address that, Ms. Gales? They would be probationary period. Uh, they've been within their probationary period during that time. 
so they would not have the protection of the grievance arbitration procedure. Uh, also, we would plan to reach out to the union to consult with them before it was finalized by council if this is the direction you want to go in. Um, the other option would be to simply require both vaccinations before the person's employed. I think the main reason employers have avoided that is the delay. Uh, it's going to be a condition after a conditional offer of employment is made, then the, that will be the requirement. And having both vaccines within the period might substantially delay um, uh, the employment of somebody, which is one of the thinking. Uh, and this is also uh, very typical in other public employers. No question, it's a good question. We would consult the union. I think our protection would be that the employees would still be within their probationary period under both the public works contract and the police contract. But it's a good point. I just don't think that you could probably get everyone vaccinated with two vaccinations in time to, to ensure that they could be employed in a timely fashion because you can't restrict your hiring to vaccinated people. You can only require the vaccination for people who want to work for Swissville. And I know you do, I mean, you do employment law. That, that's the thinking behind it. So um, I'm open to suggestions. It's just a draft policy. Any other questions? I know my comment I had shared with Mr. Price before. Um, I mean, I think this is a good thing, uh, but I do worry about the possibility of limiting ourselves in the future. Um, I guess because we're not requiring the vaccine for employment, um, but uh, again, Mr. McTurner, however you said that just a moment ago, um, that they don't have to have the vaccine to be hired uh, or to be considered for hiring, but have to have that process going in order to, to, to start work um, and, and complete that probationary phase. I think that provides a little bit more opportunity that even if someone is unvaccinated, that doesn't bar them from employment. They just need to get that process started and then we could employ them. So I, I think that satisfies my hesitation. All right, uh, hearing nothing else, let's do item E, discuss the hiring of a finance director. Do you want me to take that? Uh, why don't you? Unless unless Ms. Alfonso Wells wants to jump on, I know that she's um, not in her normal space for the meeting, and so if she, uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and take it? Mr. I Bashi. will defer to Greg. Okay, we'll have you do both of the next two, Mr. Bashi. Yeah, the next two E and F are discuss hiring of a finance director and discuss hiring of a public works director. Uh, basically, all I have to say right now is we have conducted, uh, we have uh, accepted resumes, we've conducted first and second interviews. We've selected candidates for both positions. We've made offers to two candidates, one for public works and one for finance. Both have accepted the offers uh, that we've made and we will have it on the agenda for next Wednesday to appoint a finance director and to appoint a public works director. Great, Any anyone else wanna comment on that? All right, let's move on. Uh, item G, discuss de designating. So we already did F, that was looped in with that public works director. Uh, item G, discuss designated real-time productions as Swissville's artist in residence for 2022. Uh, this is a program that Ms. Salisbury initiated last year with Four York's Players and has brought real-time intervention. Um, are they real-time productions, real-time intervention uh, to our understanding? They presented a few months ago and Ms. Salisbury, if you wanna yeah, so they are, so first off, they send their regards. Um, they uh, had hoped to be here with us tonight to do, we, they had already done another little um, sort of uh, write up for us that we had read out at a council meeting a few months ago. They had hoped to be with us tonight, but sadly their cat of blessed memory passed away today. So they were dealing with that and um, are not available to be here tonight. So they sent me a message to make sure that I conveyed that they, it's not that they're disinterested, they just weren't able to attend because of cat related situations. Um, so real time is a, um, they do productions, but they are intervention. <laughs> so, um, but they are a Swiss Vale uh, group that they do uh, custom, very, um, very creative, very diverse types of productions. Um, I went with um, 
my husband and my neighbor and Bhavani Patel, who's on council over in Edgewood, we all went to a production that they put on in the strip district about two weeks ago or so. Um, and so that production was, um, they had a number of singers come in and they put together custom written songs, each one of which was about a female serial killer talking about what happened in their childhood that caused them to grow up the way that they grew up. So they do all kinds of sort of non, very non-traditional performances, but it was sold out standing room only. Um, so uh, Bhavani Patel from Edgewood was very impressed and said that we're lucky to have them. So I felt like I got to flex a little bit on my fellow borough council member um, from another borough next door to us. So what they would like to do is they want to do a very community based um, effort where they want to get local businesses involved, they would want to get local people involved, and um, they want to be able to do a custom play or presentation, sometimes they do musicals. Um, that would be um, sort of uh, about a real person because they only do that's why it's called real time they only do real people. Um, so they only do performances that are real people. Uh, they've done a variety of series that are about real local people in the Pittsburgh area. So they're very interested in doing something that would be about a Swiss veil area person, um, maybe somebody who is alive now, maybe somebody who's a historic figure in the area. They want to make sure that they involve um, all kinds of local community groups. They want to hope, uh, they want to help um, local businesses get a boost out of it so that, you know, I don't know, maybe you would want to get a drink ticket from Still Mill or something when you go and watch the performance or whatever, so that people are drawn to the area as a destination um, to check out Swiss Vale and see what else is here. So uh, we had a suggestion, I know, on Nextdoor a few days ago where someone said that we should put up a big poll with one of those like this way to this restaurant and this way to this thing. And so it gets sort of people trying to see different things in the area as destinations of why you might come to Swiss Vale just for that. Um, they're very focused on DEI principles. They want to focus on um, a lot of BIPOC stories. So I thought that was very encouraging and it's a very diverse cast of people that they pull together. And they would also want to pull people together from the community who are interested in participating. So basically, all we would be doing is sort of giving, you know, our sort of, um, I don't know if blessing is the right word, but sort of giving, um, their auth uh, giving them our authorization to get started on the process. Um, they are very well established. They've been doing this for years. So they have the ability to fundraise on their own, get sponsorships on their own and they would be able to get you know, up and running very quickly, but they just want us to be able to say, okay, yes, so that they can start writing, producing, brainstorming, talking to people in the community and figuring out what it is that their show is going to be for us. So that's pretty much what this, uh, what this item would be, is just to sort of officially tell them, yes, it's you, good job, and uh, make that announcement and tell them to go ahead and get started on it. Um, so as a reminder, last time Poor York's Players was able to put on a, uh, a free theater camp for kids in the community. We're very grateful to, I'll say, Pastor Ansel in this context church for allowing them to use your facility. Um, so then this would be sort of the next iteration of it where they would be able to, um, you know, we'd have a new artist in residence coming in every year to be able to put on a performance and, um, you know, they're really able to run with it on their own since you know they do this regularly and put on these performances and write them from scratch and everything. Great, thanks for that introduction. Any questions or comments for Ms. Salisbury or for anyone about this agenda item? With the Artists in Residence uh, program, there we do have a budget towards this program, correct? Yeah, we have, I believe it's $2,000 set aside in the, um, in the budget because the first one um, was sort of just like cobbled together and then I gave them some money to be able to do the program um, and we had donations of space and things like that. So, um, but they are very accustomed to writing grants and soliciting sponsorships on top of that because they're a full-fledged nonprofit theater company. Um, so they would be able to, you know, take, um, 
you know, take that money and then build on it. It would just be used as like a springboard for what they're going to do. Now, are are they based in Swissville or they just want to do a production off of someone in Swissville? They live here. Oh, okay. So they, they reside here, but the business itself, the non-for-profit. Well, it's it's, not yeah, it's, it's all it's housed building. here. Yeah, they're because the founders are here. Um, so they would be very excited about doing something in their, you know, hometown as it were. Um, and so that's why I had originally planned, I was actually starting to talk to GPAC and the office for public art and things. And I was going to put out a call for proposals and say, okay, let's open this up. Everybody can apply for this. And then they heard that we had this program and they contacted me and said, can we be considered for it? So at that point I said, Ooh, you know, it's hard to say no to having a theater company that actually lives in Swiss Vale. They're already right here. Okay. I do think that we should um, in the future uh, actively uh, promote the artist in residence program so that people that we don't even know about We'll find out about it and apply. Yeah, and so that's why I had been talking to Sally Ann Klutz at the um, uh, Office for Public Art, which is sort of like an offshoot of the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council. And they have a really cool program online where people who are um, sort of, I don't want to say smaller, but you know, they're getting started kind of artists. So where, you know, to, to somebody who's, Frank Gehry isn't excited about our $2,000 in our artists in residence program, you know what I'm saying? But like somebody who's getting started, that would be a cool thing for them. So they have a, an ability to create like a database of opportunities. And then anybody who's interested in those opportunities can reach out to you. So they were just creating that database when I was reaching out to them and talking to them about it. So we would have been one of the first projects on the database. So I was getting ready to kind of get a description written up and um, have something to post. And then I was talking to some people on one of our 8 million Swiss fail related Facebook groups. <laughs> I was writing about the artists in residence program. So then they saw that and they said, wait, we're artists in Swiss fail. We want to be the artists in residence. Can we do it? And I said, oh, okay, you know, let's, let's talk to them about it. But yeah, I think that it's really um, an opportunity to sell Swiss fail as you know there's we have other things in our broader area like randy land and different things that people are aware of that are some larger scale art projects and i think it's a really cool opportunity to sell swiss Vale as somewhere that we have artsy things we have cool creative people who live here so um when we had poor york's players i was able to get Oh, there's a very loud motorcycle right outside my window. Sorry about that. Um, when we had Poor York's players here, I was able to get um, some coverage on KDKA. We had a nice um, spread about it in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. We had our beloved local Valley Mirror, and we had uh, Next Pittsburgh also did some nice coverage of it. So I'd like to continue that theme to kind of keep promoting Swiss Vale. And then, of course, it also has the dual benefit of promoting the organization itself. So it's a benefit to the organization of being able to um, get a little bit of a profile boost. And Mr. Miller, is there any just, way uh, Mr. Um, Miller, hold on. Else, like the high yeah. schools can be incorporated, like to have some kids be a part of the production or even teach them to, you know, maybe be, you know, a part of the process of what it looks like to create these um, events? Yeah, and I think one of the things that people reached out to me about after we had the first, um, like, uh, I, I call it a theater camp. Some people told me I should call it an acting camp. Maybe I was like a theater dork when I was a kid. So maybe I think theater camp sounds better. But um, so one of the things that people pointed out to me is that there's a lot of teenagers in the area who get really excited about the opportunities that we have because of things like the Cary Furnace Rivers of Steel site, because they are building those um, production studios and things. And then of course we had Mind Hunter that was filmed here. I think they even used Mr. Price's office as part of their stage at some point or their scenery. Um, so there are some of the teenagers around here who are really excited about having an opportunity to maybe get a little bit of acting chops so that they can have something to then show to those types of places and try to get maybe, you know, a, 
a small part. There are no small parts. There are only small boroughs. No, but they uh, want to try to get you know a small part in one of these productions that films in the area. So I think there's definitely opportunities to do just exactly what you're talking about and get people interested in because we do have you know people who are musically inclined and who do already act and do artistic things in the area. Thank you. And I will, uh, I want to speak specifically to Mr. Price's uh, point as well, that I was speaking to Mr. Batchy within the last couple of weeks about this. Um, and I think this is, I, I fully support real-time productions. I think that it's a, a, a perfect fit for us being a Swiss film uh, owned nonprofit residents uh, as we're continuing to get this, this program up on uh, up and running. Um, but I was thinking about this in terms of similar to how we do the boards and commissions, that there is uh, kind of a, an opening. Um, I, and th this is putting the cart a little bit before the horse, but what I envisioned was more of a uh, calendar year process where, you know, after the budget is passed, January through April, if you will, we accept applications for the artists and res residents and then, uh, you know, make a decision maybe at the, the July meeting and then that runs um, that, that they're compensated out of the, the current year budget, but that program would want run from, you know, July, August through, you know, yeah. the, the following April, something like that. Uh, but but to do exactly what you said is to open it up so that you know more more people can apply uh, and, and we can kind of decide what what would fit best for our borough whether it be you know both of these two have to do with more theater drama maybe we want someone who is more of into uh, music art maybe in, in the future maybe we want someone who's more into graphic art uh, you know to to open that up and to to have uh, more opportunities that we can choose from. Yeah, I mean, one thing I thought of is next year before we tear the borough building down, it'd be fun for people to spray paint it or something. You know, if we're going to tear it down anyway, we might as well have some graffiti art on it with a theme of destruction or something. I don't know. Um, I majored in art history. I get a little artsy occasionally. Um, so, but yeah, I want to get help from people who know how to write those um, calls for proposals because I've never written one myself before. So that's why I was reaching out to GPAC and places for some advice. And I know that we have some people in the community who also know how to do that. So I want to get a jump start on that and start working on that for next time. Um, and start putting together a really good proposal because I've been told that if you don't really write it in exactly the right way, it doesn't give people enough information to be able to apply in an effective way. So I want to make sure that we have an attractive um, pitch, if you will. That sounds all. That all sounds great. Um, wonderful. Well, Ms. Salisbury, thanks for your work in getting this program up and running, and just the way in which you have been um, navigating and, and keeping this running. I'm over uh, the moon about it, honestly. I was super excited to be able to take a council member from another borough to a thing and say, look, Swiss Gale's doing this really cool artsy thing, and these people live in our borough, and we hope that they're going to be our artists and residents and made me feel quite fancy. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> let's, I mean, let's make sure this is on the agenda to vote for next week and to make it official and uh, let Molly and Rusty, correct? That's their names. Molly and Rusty uh, take, take the lead and do what they're going to do in the area. Okay, well, let's move to the next item, which is uh, item H, which we've already had some discussion around, uh, but this is uh, with uh, Dr. Bond Steele. Uh, H is discuss collaboration with Humane Action Pittsburgh to install a native species pollinator garden in the 7700 block of Edgewood Avenue, uh, as it was noted next door to the Arby's, on property owned by Swissfell Borough. So any, I know this has kind of already been introduced. Um, anyone want to jump in and make any comments? I like the idea of supporting a native species pollinator garden. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the highest and best use for that particular parcel. Uh, Swissville has many vacant parcels that the borough actually owns. Um, that parcel, for example, is, from what I can tell, large enough uh, to have a dog park. Uh, it's seven or 8,000 square feet. Um, but I'm hesitant to commit to using that parcel for this project at, at this time until we have a chance to discuss our land use better. So if I can comment on that, I had thought about the same thing with the dog park because I have two dogs myself. Um, so for me, what I would like to see, because we do, you're right, we do have a bunch of vacant lots and we could put different things to different use. The issue with this one for a dog park is for me parking because people would either end up parking at Arby's and getting towed 
or they would park along that alley that's between this lot and Arby's. And then that causes problems for people who live back there and use it because that's the parking for those, um, like, I don't know if they're townhouses or apartments or whatever you'd call those that are along there. Um, and then there isn't any parking along, um, it goes from South Braddock and then it turns into Edgewood, Edgewood Avenue. Um, so there's no parking until you get way down past the collision uh, repair place. And then um, almost really like I'm on Columbia, my office is at Columbia and Edgewood. And that's where you first start to have parking, which is quite a hike all the way down the street. So you'd either have to take a good chunk of that property and turn it into parking spaces or try to figure out how to widen the road or do something to create parking because otherwise there isn't really any option for somebody to drive over there with a dog or something like that and then leave them there. So um, we did at a previous meeting, we've had conversations with Mr. McTiernan where we asked him to look into options for acquiring the former GAR home site. Um, I think that would be a fantastic opportunity for a dog park that does have options for parking over there. And then I've had people from that part of town tell me that we kind of neglect that part of town and we don't, um, you know, we don't put parks over there as much and we don't do so much over there. So I would like to make sure that we dedicate a lot of opportunity um, to that. So I've had some conversations with Jay Costa's office about that project. And I think that if we can get title to it, we can get funding to do something for it. And it's big enough, it's over an acre that is, that we could use it as something like a dog park and um, you know, a regular park. We could have different options for it. But this in particular, I just think that it's because of where it is, it's so high traffic that the parking thing doesn't make it a convenient dog park option. I don't know. Um... It would depend on what kind of uh, usage you would expect. You might only need uh, two or three parking spaces and a lot may provide that. I, I'm just saying that before we would vote on this in a week, you know, I would wanna explore whether or not there are other uses for that particular parcel because it's so centrally located. A pollinator garden, you know, could be down uh, at the LGAR home or at, many of the other lots. The other option for a lot that I had pitched for this idea is where we have the flax experimental mm -hmm. planting going on. Um, so for people who might be watching who don't remember where that is, it's over on uh, Monongahela. There's that sort of large green space there. Um, is that park? Is that what the park is? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I have a terrible sense of direction. I can't remember street names. So um, there's also that big space over there. So that would also be another option. I think that in terms of dog park has the same problems because um, I've thought about that being a dog park too. And I think that the parking over there is a little bit too tight for it. Um, but I think that would also be another option. Um, so I think that we have, I mean, we have no shortage of vacant lots in Swissvale, but the one that's over on that South Braddock and Edgewood area is just so visible that I hate to leave it gravel and ugly forever. But uh, for a pollinator garden, some of these lots already have topsoil and you don't need to bring in uh, your soil at, the, at that expense. One thing I do have, and I'm sorry, I know other people have hands up, so I'll, this is my last thing I'm going to say, but um, one thing I do have a concern about with the uh, dog park concept is, as we've mentioned before, we don't really have enough people working in DPW. There are a lot of areas around town that are not well maintained. Like we do have a lot of, we have a litter problem that we talk about a lot. Um, and so one of my concerns would be that we have the tragedy of the commons where people would take their dogs there. They definitely would not clean up the poop after their dogs. And then we would have sort of a situation where DPW has another task to do. My dog is making a noise in the background while I'm talking to you. Um, we would have another task for DPW to do of not only mowing over there all the time, but picking up poop. So I think that we have to have a conversation if we do decide to do a dog park wherever we end up doing it that um, we have to figure out what our maintenance plan would be for it. Because I think, unfortunately, we can't just rely on residents to always clean up after themselves because some people just don't. So um, I 
I agree with Ms. Salisbury's comments about the parking being an issue. And actually, I, I was going to suggest park because there are those, those two plots uh, that, that kind of go around the, I think it's actually where I saw a picture on Facebook this week. It's where, is that where the old Legion was on one of those plots in the center of park? I don't know. Do you, are you referring to the one that's where the flax is? So it's not exactly, the flax is on Monongahela, but if you actually yeah. turn down park from Monongahela, there's kind of those two, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of almost have like a roundabout with those two green yeah. spaces. Um, I, I don't know, I think I saw a, a picture that made it look like that's where the old Legion was. Yeah, the American um, Legion was when you go into Park, park Avenue, it was in that first section straight ahead. Yeah, so anyway, I think that would be a space that I've, I've advocated to consider a dog park, even on the short term, uh, but maybe as a pollinator in the future. Uh, I love this idea. I think this is something that we need to do. I think it fits with what we've been trying to do. Uh, the only question I have about that uh, 7700 block of Edgewood um, is as we are in this process of the municipal, and I've talked to Mr. Batchy about this, um, as we're in the process of the municipal building demolition and reconstruction, uh, one of the pieces that is currently on the Roslyn Street plot that we have to figure out where it's going to go is the salt bin. Um, I don't know that any of us want it on the Roslyn Street plot. I don't know that it's going to fit on the Roslyn Street plot based off of the, the, the uh, plans that have been coming from CORE. Uh, that is a space that I have considered that, that I thought could be uh, feasible for it. Um, I know Mr. Batchy has some other avenues that he is looking at. Um, and so I don't necessarily know that we know where it's going to go just yet, but I want to make sure that like something like Clover, if we put that on, is going to be fine. Uh, if in some that some sometime in the future we need to make an adjustment to the use of that that space, once you start planting trees, though, uh, I think that becomes a little bit more um, permanent, if you will. Um, I mean, you can always uproot the tree, but uh, a little bit more difficult to to renovate that space. So um, I, I, I totally think we should do this. I, I might suggest that perhaps if we want to vote on this next week, that we take out the actual block number um, because the the language was. Let me see what the language was to collaborate, discuss collaboration, and maybe we enter into some kind of, you know, make a motion to enter into a collaboration with them, which allows us some extra time to assess inventory, what plots we have and which plot would be best um, in that. Um, so that those are my only thoughts. I, again, I, I'm fully on board with this. I'm just concerned. I, I wanna make sure we're not limiting ourselves in the future for uh, something that is necessary like our salt bin for our winter season. I just realized I forgot to mention something by the way, which might be relevant. I don't know if this is on anybody's mind, but we would not be leasing the, um, the space to them for the park. So when I was speaking with Mr. Batchy, that was sort of my first question. And his first question is what the relationship would be. Because in the past, when we've worked with organizations like 412 Food Rescue, Ecotone Renewables, the Worm Return Project, um, we always have a contract with them. We're releasing space to them. So I did just want to mention that we're not actually leasing the land to the organization or anything. It's more something that they're just collaborating with us. We would still own the property. Um, in terms of the salt bin, um, I spoke to Mr. Batchy about it, and I don't want to speak for him, so maybe he wants to jump in, but um, personally for me, that's such a major thoroughfare through town that I hate to have it be like an ugly salt bin. Um, the other thing that I would be worried about is people going and basically just helping themselves to the salt, because right now the salt is behind the police department, which tends to kind of discourage theft, I would hope anyway. <laughs> um, so I would be kind of concerned just from an aesthetic perspective, because if you're coming along on the busway and you look out the window, that's what you're seeing of Swiss Vale. If you are driving along, that's what you're seeing of Swiss Vale. And as of now, it's an ugly lot. And I think it'd be worse if it were salt. So I get what you mean where you want to have a space to put the salt, but I would really hate to put the salt there because it is such a highly visible area. And I would much rather see it be a nice, pretty green space than a salt bin. Yeah. And I fully agree with that. I, I don't know that I want salt there. I just want to make sure, I mean, like we can't put salt on Memorial Field. Like we've got space down there, but that's too far away. You don't want to paint yourself away. into a corner. It, it, exactly. And, and that, that's all my, my question. I agree. That's not the ideal setting, but I want to make sure that we don't, we don't, um, yeah, limit ourselves in the future because we need to put it somewhere. Uh, Ms. Scales, you have your hand up. Yes. So I wanted to just say that I'm not prepared to vote on this next week. Um, I like the idea of the HAP Hive program because that's what the, the program is. Um, but it, there's a lot of information that we still need about the program, such as costs, such as sources, fun, source of funding, source, 
such as the detailed plan, such as time frames, um, to review the DEI policy. So I like the idea, but there's a lot of information that we don't have just yet to actually make a vote on it. I think we need to get this additional information, have this for review, and then we can actually take a vote on it. Um, I agree with uh, Bill in terms of the dog park. Like we've been talking about this since we got sworn in and we're going on year three and we still haven't done anything. And I'm seeing more and more residents who have dogs and they have nowhere to take their dogs. Scrap goes on social media all the time complaining about dogs being taken to Memorial Field for to poop, to poop, but there's no space for our residents to take their dogs. So I'm a dog lover, Bill's a dog lover, you guys are dog lovers. We're fine with seeing dogs walking down the streets. And I don't lose, I don't lose my cap when I see dogs poop in my yard. But there are residents who have complained about that that they do have it, take issue with it. And so the solution is not to turn around and yell at the people who have dogs. The solution is to turn around and look at us who've been talking about this going on three years about a dog park. And so I get that there's parking, but equally there's a parking issue if we put the project there because folks are gonna have to drive to park at the, at the garden. They don't all just walk to participate. Some drive and park and participate at, at for the program. I know firsthand with the garden that we have. So I think that I did ask earlier for a map, like of all of our vacant lots and what's being used and what's not being used to have a, a better understanding in terms of what is available and what's not available. But I like the idea, but I'm not prepared to vote, nor am I prepared to vote for this project to take place on that end. Like we really need to consider if this is a big enough space for a dog park, why not consider that and then consider another vacant space for the project when we get all this, this information that we still need because we don't have it. Well, I mean, I think, it, I thought it was pretty clear that the funding was out of our hands, like this isn't going to cost us anything. The only cost to the to the borough is the DPW hours to collect the already paid topsoil and mulch uh, in in the truck and bring it there. So, I mean, I'm not saying that you know there's not some other good questions that you're asking, but I, I know that a lot of times it comes down to dollars and cents. And I think one of the advantages of this project is that it wasn't going to actually cost us anything. So yeah, I, just I like make to sure know that where those dollars and cents are coming. Like some type of proposal, some some type of plan so that I can make, once again, an, an informed decision. I like the idea. I've heard nothing but good things in terms of a, a native species garden. And we have that form of gardeners in Swissville that love, love the idea. And now I know what the actual name of the program, which is HAP Hive Program. I still like the idea of the program. I'm just not prepared to, to vote on it next week, being presented with it and understanding there's still pieces of information that I don't have. I think it's okay to say like, let's take another month. You know, it's not an emergency. Um, I think it's okay to take a little bit more time and consider it. In terms of money, um, you know, we are right, Mr. Ansel, that it's basically the only thing that we have to, um, the only thing that we have to participate in terms of money is basically paying for the staff time to drop off some topsoil because they're getting everything else um, donated and it'll be volunteer done. So they have a professional um, gardener who's um, helping draw up the plans and so forth. So their guesstimate at what this would cost would be around about $10,000 for them. Um, just to give a sense of like community interest, I've actually already had somebody text me while we're in the meeting and offer $500 donation. So that seemed like a popular thing. Um, in terms of dog park sighting, um, as somebody who does have two dogs, 
I would not take them to a dog park that's on such a busy street like that because I would be terrified that they would escape. Like I have little dogs. I have a dachshund and a chihuahua beagle mix. And so I would be terrified that they would escape and get hit by a car. So I think that's why people take them to Memorial Field because it is a little bit more out of the way. It's in a residential area and it's right it's not right by a major thoroughfare like that. So for me, when I'm looking at a site for where I think a dog park should be, it needs to be something that's far enough away from a main road to where I would feel comfortable actually having my dog run around there. Because otherwise, like I would not feel comfortable doing that on Monongahela because that's so high traffic. I would not feel comfortable doing that on um, that South Braddock and Edgewood sort of corridor area because it's, it's so high traffic either. But yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking another month to say, hey, can you put together a picture of what you want this to look like, that kind of thing. But they will take care of the fundraising aspect of it. Great. Ms. Scales, can I move on to Mr. Miser? Yeah. Great. Go ahead, Mr. Miser. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, just first say that I am in full support of beautifying that lot. That lot is in a very high traffic area and is very ugly, in my opinion, currently. Um, and, you know, both uh, Ms. Salisbury's previous proposal for just, you know, where we would have to pay to put a park there. And then this proposal, I like even better because we're not paying for it uh, to put the garden there, I, I think is a, a wonderful thing. Um, you know, I, I understand the concerns and wanting to see a proposal or maybe like a rendering of what this would look like. So I would be in support of us entering into a uh, partnership with with this group, but not necessarily agreeing to that plot, um, but at least agreeing to move forward to to get that additional information from them. Um, you know, in regards to the dog park, I, I do not think that location would be a good dog park at all. Uh, there is another dog park less than a mile from that location already in Edgewood Borough at Dixon Park. Um, it's seven tenths. I, I just looked it up. It's from that lot. It's seven tenths of a mile away. Um, and I think there's other lots in the borough of, you know, in, in more residential areas of the borough that would benefit from a dog park in that location. So I certainly support the dog park. I don't think that's the spot for it. Uh, but I do fully support anything that would beautify that spot. I also know when we discussed this previously, I think that would be a great spot for a welcome to Swissvale sign since you're coming into Swissvale on Edgewood Avenue right now and you're greeted with a big gravel lot, I think it would look, I think it would actually be very nice to see native plant species, green space, maybe a few benches and a nice sign welcoming people to Swissvale there. So, uh, you know, I, I'm fine deferring the vote for, you know, the actual location and, and completely stamping like, yeah, go ahead and do it. But I, you know, how, how long has that lot been vacant and covered in gravel? A long time i you know we have two years i think they tore something down that was yeah there. We, we've had two opportunities here in the past couple months to to beautify that area and i think we should should at least keep the wheels moving on that so i i'm i'm up for moving into an agreement if if we don't want the vote to be specific to that plot i i'm okay with that but i i fully support this idea so uh maybe if I could kind of direct us a little bit on this. Um, I don't know that we need to, if we just, it sounds like there's enough traction for us to continue to have conversations with the organization, um, what, what were they, the Humane Action Pittsburgh, uh, to continue to develop this plan. So I don't know that we need to vote on anything next week. Uh, I think let's just keep, especially because it doesn't involve, you know, difference between something like Green Edge, uh, we, I wanted, we wanted to enter into that because we knew it was going to utilize borough resources with the solicitor uh, to make that happen. So since this is, doesn't require those kinds of resources, let's just, you know, Ms. Salisbury, if you want to continue to flex that out uh, uh, with, with them, um, may, maybe have uh, Dr. Bonsteel can send uh, through you or just directly to all of us things like uh, Ms., some of the stuff that Ms. Scales requested, you know, their DEI statement and some of the plans and, and visions they have for it. Um, the other thing that I'd like to make sure that is if you could have conversations with them about is just to make sure that they're aware of what our ordinances are on bees, because it would probably be in poor form if we didn't follow our own ordinances of, you know. So yeah, actually, the reason this conversation started is because Dr. Bonsteel was fixing my filling. And I was talking to him about the bee ordinance because it was when we were doing the chicken and bee ordinance. 
And um, so I was talking to him because I knew that his organization was getting into the B, the B space. I don't know what you call it, um, because they are so interested not only in general, you know, animal welfare, like preventing cruelty to elephants, but also making sure that we have animals um, that are essential like bees. So I was talking to him about how we we're passing the chicken and bee ordinance. And so he wanted to see what that looked like. And so I had shown their organization um, that information. And so that's kind of what kicked off this whole conversation is the fact that we did pass the ordinance. So they're totally aware of that. And they're very excited because that's like why they were thinking that we're kind of forward thinking and passing this kind of stuff. Because a lot of places have not put any kind of legislation in place for the bees. Well, that's great. Well, let's keep that moving forward. Um, the other request I wanted to ask, uh, Mr. Miser, and you can say no to this, but uh, you are uh, the resident data person on council. Um, and so, you know, I know there's a list that Mr. Batchy has of some of the properties that the borough does own, like in a written list, like an Excel spreadsheet kind of thing. I don't know if there's any way with like a GIS or something that you can do to kind of uh, shade on a map where those are for us. If that's going to take like hours and hours and you can't do it, that's okay. I just thought if anyone can do it out of the seven of us, it's you. Um, so maybe it, I'd that. be happy to take a stab at it if if I can get that list um, in whatever formats it's in now. See if I can and can whip something up. If if like you said, if it's going to take me hours and hours, it's not not going to happen timely. But I will. I, I'm certainly happy to work on that. Unless it's a joy for you, then those hours and hours are just going to go real you know, quick. So I uh, just maps in my yeah. <laughs> dreams all night. Yes. Mr. Batch, if you don't mind sending to actually, can you just send to all of us that list uh, that I know I've seen at one point in time that has the, the different properties that Swissville uh, is an ownership of? Would you be yeah, able to send that? Well, I, can, okay. I can try to find that and pull that up and I'll send it out to everybody. I, I did see Mr. Smith Scales. Um, email right before the meeting. I was out of the in and out of the office most of the afternoon today and I didn't see that today. Otherwise I would have sent that out, but I'll get it out to everybody so that uh, you can take a look at it. Perfect. Thank the you. The version of the list that I received maybe about a year ago. I, I, I do know that we've sold off one or two parcels and we might have added some parcels. So I don't know if it uh, Greg, is the list current to what we actually have? It will be when I I'll I'll re I'll review it and make sure it is current. Okay. And no worries, Greg. Believe me, I didn't think I would get it today. So, oh, yeah. yeah, I'll get it out there, everybody. Well, that sounds good. I think that's a good direction. Um, progress on this, we can continue to because because it sounds like for the most part, everyone. I mean, I think we're all on board that this would be something good for us um, to protect pollinators and could be a great show. Uh, put continuing to put Swissville on the map and some of those those forward thinking areas. So um, let's just continue to explore what that would look like. Okay, let's move to our last agenda item, which is discuss regulating the planting of bamboo in Swissville. And I just wanna acknowledge that this is specifically, it doesn't say it on there, but is running bamboo uh, as opposed to uh, clumping bamboo. Um, so I, I requested Mr. Batchy put this on the agenda. I had received an email from a resident who um, is just having a, a little bit of a, um, a concern with a neighbor who has planted running bamboo uh, on their property. Uh, running bamboo, if you just do a little bit of, of quick Google search, you can see that it is something that is um, nice for privacy. It's in the grass family, it can grow pretty quickly, uh, but the roots are pretty potent um, and have, if it's too close to a structure, can produce um, foundational issues uh, and damage to, to that foundation. And so um, the resident you know, had, had sent me uh, some questions about it to say, hey, what do we do about this? Um, there's really no code that, you know, they were, they were trying to get code enforcement involved in terms of um, not wanting this bamboo on their property or encroaching on their property. And, and because there's no ordinance specifically about it, they uh, weren't sure necessarily what direction to take. And so, um, you know, they, they had sent, the, the individual had sent to me an, uh, a sample ordinance from another community, I think it was in Bucks County, uh, that had actually um, uh, kind of regulated certain uh, invasive or nuisance, I think they call it nuisance species of plants for planting. And uh, I just wanted to bring it to us as a discussion. I mean, I think this is, you know, I'll just kind of set the stage of the, the, the two sides of the conversation and, and feel free then to, to kind of jump in. You know, I think this resident does have a, a real concern. Uh, I, I, especially if it is planted, if it's one thing, if it's, you know, 50, 50 feet away from a structure, but if it's pretty close to a home, 
um, especially in an urban setting like ours with high density, uh, it, there is concerns on the house. Um, at the same time, you know, is this something that, uh, is it an overreach of the borough for us to, to make a decision like this? I do know that Pennsylvania has uh, its own kind of um, organization and administration that regulates the use of plants and, and this running bamboo, these running bamboo species are not on their list. Uh, so, you know, there, there's some things to think about there um, and just trying to figure out what to do going forward. So that's about all the information I have, if anyone wants to jump in. Yeah, well, I just want to say, oh, sorry, oh, sorry well, Dan, I, uh, uh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say that I really do think that there should be something because um, it is more than annoying when a neighbor plants something in their garden and it ends up in yours, particularly if it's going to cause property damage. It's an invasive species. It is not native, um, so not indigenous. Um, and I think people need to take care of what they're going to actually put in their garden. It'd be one thing if it was an accident and they were just like, oh my goodness, let me help you out here because my plant is running into your yard, but it's a whole different degree of problem when you plant something that's invasive and then it starts attacking your neighbor's um, property and the neighbor can't do anything about it. So, um, you know, I think that needs to be addressed. I did see somewhere that there have been other properties or actually there was one other place or two other places here in Pennsylvania that they did pass an ordinance about that. And I, I personally do not have a problem with passing one here in Swissvale. I think that'd be great. All right, Ms. Salisbury, why don't you go ahead? You have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, so this started um, because I had somebody reach out to me, a resident reach out to me because their neighbor has planted this type of bamboo. And I did research on it. And basically to kill this, you have to kind of nuke it from orbit. <laughs> it's sort of impossible to kill it. Um, you know, you can hack at it underground, but it grows out of rhizomes that sort of grow underground and just reproduce and you can't get it all. And you can dig it up and try to encase it in cement and which of course ruins your yard. Um, so once somebody plants it, it really is very, very difficult because it grows like a weed. And um, I mean, that's why it's like a sustainable product when people plant it intentionally because it grows so fast. So um, I've had some folks who are concerned that, hey, it'll take over my yard and then I'll have to spend thousands of dollars to get rid of it. Um, I'll have to pour, you know, Roundup or other really gnarly chemicals all over my yard to try to kill it. I don't want to have to do that. So people are hoping that we can stop it before it gets started. So um, I think everybody on council received, there's a model bamboo ordinance, kind of like how there was that model chicken bee ordinance that we use. So the resident was hoping that we would be able to review that and potentially implement that because when they spoke to code, there is no current way for them to make somebody stop having this. And it's one of those things, it's like if you've ever planted mint and it grows everywhere, it's like mint on steroids. So it's one of those things that if your neighbor does it, there's no way for you to keep it out of your yard. It'll grow under your fence, it'll grow through your yard. And they're hoping that we could maybe um, prohibit it so that it would not be an issue um, that people have to spend a lot of money to deal with here. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. I know the email was uh, addressed kind of, the greeting was to me, but I forgot that all of you were, were CC'd on that. So uh, you did all see all that. So I'll, I didn't need to share any of that for you, but it's good for the public to hear as well. Uh, Ms. Scales, go ahead and chime in. Yeah, I am hoping that we can do something about this because for, for this particular resident, unfortunately, they've just been having the, the, the worst time in terms of with having a good neighbor, basically. Um, and so this is just in another act that, that is taking place that basically that is impacting them. And so, you know, to tell someone, oh, well, take it to court, not everybody has the means nor the knowledge in terms of what what do you even put on the complaint so if we could incorporate something in our ordinances that then our code enforcement can help with this issue i'd be happy and you know as i said there the, you, you just do a quick google search and you can see that this is a problem lots of places uh that, that this is a, a legitimate thing that um it's very difficult, as you said, I, I, the rhizomes, I, again, I, I'm not exactly sure of all the signs of it, but uh, a lot of people do talk about that. Um, Mr. Wilhelm, I don't know, you know, if you 
I know code enforcement was involved in their particular situation. I don't know if you have any um, comments about the, you know, a, as being in charge of code enforcement of the a potential of, of adding an ordinance that kind of put some, some uh, nuisance plants on it to restrict or regulate the planting of that. Um, I don't know the specific interaction, but the, the, the fire marshal who was handling that is accurate. There are no ordinances that um, we currently have that regulate planting. As far as any other legal aspects related to that, I would defer to the attorney. I don't have any um, comment on whether or not, I don't know how, you know, I guess we'd have to teach our people how to identify what type of plants we're enforcing at that point. Um, that's the only thing I can see, because if we get it wrong, then I guess we'd get in trouble. Okay, uh, well, thank you for those comments. Um, you know, the other thing I think to take note, which is even if we took action on this, I think, it, I don't know if it would necessarily resolve the situation that we're talking about because most like the, the sample ordinance had a grandfathered clause of uh, pretty much bam, the, the running bamboo that was already in existence was allowed to stay. You just couldn't plant new stuff. And so again, I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure how to resolve uh, this particular situation, but um, it sounds I mean, like... I wouldn't put in the grandfather clause because it would still be a problem that you would have something in your yard that's invasive to somebody else's. So, I mean, it's it's up to us whether or not we put in the grandfather clause. That's up to us. Well, Mr. McTiernan, do we do we put ourselves in any liability if we, you know, basically say uh, there's something that is not necessarily regulated, not necessarily a violation of code one moment, and then all of a sudden it is a violation of code? Um could that well, could there be any backlash in the borough for that if it if it goes into your neighbor's yard so i mean particularly if it goes into your neighbor's yard well the even the ordinances that grandfather uh the plant do prohibit the neighbor from allowing it to go in the neighboring yes uh, a lawn or grass i think the complaint that i saw some of the plant that was closest to the building was not necessarily on the complaining party's property. It was just very near. And I think it was on the person who planted its property. So even the model ordinances do uh, require the person who's already planted, even if it's grandfather, it's not allowed to go on somebody else's uh, property. And it's there are certain protections they're supposed to take in order to prevent it from spreading, certain types of containers and things of that nature. So it's not sort of, Oh, if you've already planted it, it's okay. You don't have any responsibility. It's not that uh, uh, unrestrictive. But on the other hand, it does not say you have to go out and tear it all out. So yeah. that was halfway uh, compromise in the existing ordinances. But, but to be more specific, I don't think there's anything that would prohibit you from declaring it a nuisance. But then the enforcement would be an issue if you're requiring people to go to the expense and the trouble of removing it from their own property. But, the, but we have the ability to, the authority to do that, that we can uh, say this is now a, a nuisance. And if you do have it on your property uh, that you need to, at your own cost, remove it. Is that something that's in, within our right to do? Yeah, I'm not saying that it would, uh, you wouldn't get a protest or you wouldn't get any pushback, but, uh, and you might have to defend the fact that it's such a nuisance that you don't want to even allow it to continue. So it's certainly easier to grandfather, but I don't think there's anything to prohibit you from declaring something a nuisance just because that it's in existence doesn't necessarily protect it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Ms. Scales, go ahead. And it, it sounds like from um, Mr. Wilhelm's comment that we will need to make sure our code enforcement officers are properly trained uh, before making this ordinance effective so that they know how to actually carry out the duties correctly. It's not necessarily carry out the duties correctly. We could follow the statutory requirement of the ordinance and the, the standard procedure for enforcement of those ordinances through the magisterial district. The issue is um, making sure that they're trained in identifying this particular plant and make yeah. sure that there's no other issues that they don't start. If there's other forms of bamboo, I'm not a bamboo connoisseur. I don't know the difference between bamboo A and bamboo B. And I don't know what types of bamboo we have in our community. So that would be an issue that we'd have to overcome, but everything's overcomable. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out how we get that information in the training 
And, you know, if the courts accept our word is that's what it is. <laughs> that's the other thing. Because then it becomes a dispute issue when we end up in front of the magistrate. I say that it's this particular type of bamboo and the other person says, no, it's this type of bamboo. How do we resolve that? That, that was going to be my kind of follow-up question as well. It, you know, the sample ordinance uh, for Lower Marion that was sent to us in the email, you know, it, it lists very specific uh, species of plants, species of grass, you know, different things. And, and uh, sorry, I am, I'm, I'm struggling to keep three plants alive in my backyard. So I'm not, I, is species the, uh, the correct thing to say for plants? But anyway, uh, it's, it's very specific about the types of plants. And if, if we're going to get that specific, I, I do agree that I, I can see it very easily where the property owner goes, yeah, this isn't that species sorry you know there would have to be some sort of you know and i don't know how this particular municipality handles that i do agree we should do something about you know nuisance growth that especially is threatening other people's property but as far as identifying specific uh, types and species of plants uh, that seems a little bit more difficult to me well i apologize was that upper marion or lower marion because i believe i know a commissioner in upper marion uh lower lower marion okay which appears to be in Montgomery County. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah Ms. Salisbury. Sorry, um, I was just going to say that uh, I've recently discovered something that's delightful, which is that there are plant apps that you can get on your phone. And I have a Google Pixel. So if you have Google Lens on your Google phone, like you just go into the camera app and then you swipe to mode and you take a picture of the plant and then it searches the sum total of human knowledge uh, via pictures of that plant online and it'll identify for you. So if you never were in Girl Scouts as I was not, and you don't know whatever that rhyme is about leaves of three or whatever, and you don't know what poison ivy is, you can just Google it um, through the picture on your phone and it'll show you what the plant species is. And then there's a bunch of other different um, apps for iOS and things that you can use for plant identification. So I know people who do like foraging and stuff are um, big into using those, or just if you wanna know what the pretty flower in front of your neighbor's house is, but you don't wanna to talk to them because they're weird. That can also be a helpful tool. So just wanted to suggest that so that people don't have to like get their merit badge in bambooology. So it sounds like resources, not just for residents, but uh, perhaps that could even be utilized for code enforcement to uh, Chief Wilhelm's you know, concern that, that uh, you know, we're not necessarily training a bunch of. The, uh, the, I don't the, know that that's admissible in court, though. Mr. McTiernan would have to to elaborate on that. I, I do like the mental image of somebody from code enforcement standing there with a camera trying to get a, a positive identification of, of vegetation growing in someone's yard. It, oh, I've been is. a creepy weirdo taking a picture <laughs> of somebody's flower in front of their house while they opened their front door to see why I was a creepy person taking a picture of their front door. And I had to explain to them that I liked whatever their cute flower was and was trying to figure out what it is. So yeah, it's a, it's a thing. <laughs> I attempted to use one of those apps for a tree behind my house. That's actually in Frick Park, but uh, it ended up going through a bunch of a web of questions saying is it this or that or this or that and then it basically got to the end and was like i don't know so i still don't know what that tree is but it is cool that that technology exists i will say that the burrow took my tree when it um, was growing into my neighbor's pipes so the point would be that um regardless of whether the bamboo is a certain type or something your stuff should not be growing into or damaging someone else's property which I think is is the part that makes the most sense. Um, I really like that tree, but it is gone. Um, and and once again, if somebody else had a, tr a tree or bamboo or something that is invading their neighbor's yard and taking out their pipes or, or their structure or anything like that, then that should be you know that it that it's on them to correct that problem. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. If it's if it's encroaching over into your property that it, you know, into somebody else's property, it should be dealt with, at least from uh, the email we received, it didn't sound like that was happening yet. It's just they were concerned that that particular plant was in close proximity to their property. So 
Mr. Wilhelm, if I could, if I could uh, pick your brain again about this, because that, that I've had some conversations with both Mr. Matchy and Mr. McTiernan about this particular situation. And um, if, you know, let's just say, forgetting, putting any new ordinances aside, uh, you have this bamboo, uh, it, it's growing, let's say it is hypothetically growing into the complaining residents yard and space. Do they have any recourse, like to Ms. Alfonso Wells's point about the tree, do they have any recourse? Is that a code violation to the neighbor? Um, yes, it is. And we've had situations like that where we have um, been in, in citations were issued um, and it's gone both ways. Uh, basically, we, we always send a letter if there is an issue where there is a nuisance tree hanging over another tree. It, primarily, it's been with berries and things like that coming down. And, um, but we always tell the property owner that you can trim that tree from your property as you deem necessary. Obviously, we can't give permission to go to the other property to trespass to take the tree down. But we've had split, the split decisions when we've gotten to the magistrate in cases like that. Um, where the magistrate in some cases said, you have to cut the tree down to the property owner. In other cases, he said to the other party, just trim the tree back that you don't want on your property. And then the ones that we have had when they got downtown to appeals court, for those who appealed it, they dismissed it. Okay. So what I'm hearing from unless that it is- causing property damage. If it, unless it was causing property damage, they just pretty much yeah. ultimately got dismissed. And you don't want to wait until property damage happens to file that complaint. Right. So I mean, that's just the experience over the last, you know, twelve years of what yeah. we deal with. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that that feedback, that information. Um, so what what I'm hearing from from folks is it sounds like there is a desire to continue to move forward with this. Um, I, I would say next steps would be uh, for Mr. McTiernan perhaps to to look at the. Um, the sample that was that was uh, sent, uh, Mr. McTiernan, I can pass it. I don't remember if I passed it on to you or not, um, but I can I can send something to you, uh, and you can see maybe some other ones out there, kind of like we did with the B ordinance, to to put together a draft of what something that might make sense for us as a borough. Uh, I think it's also important that this is, you know, while I I fully sympathize with the complaint from the resident, um, there may be people who have bamboo that love their bamboo that are residents that. Uh, I think also should have a space to to chime in and say, save our bamboo. I don't know, I'm not anticipating a, a big protest for that, but uh, wanting to make sure that there is space for residents that this would affect to weigh in as well. Uh, and we will continue the process and move forward. Does that seem fair? And I'll follow up on that direction. Other council members, you, does that seem in alignment with kind of where we're? All right, I'm not hearing anything, so I'll just assume that's a yes. I always yeah. like the model ordinance so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good place, a great place to start. Okay, well, that covers, we had a lot of agenda items tonight. So that covers our agenda items. Uh, items. Let's move to the departmental reports. Um, for police, we have guest appearance, Detective John Corrado. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, some exciting news on uh, Saturday, August 6th, the Funeral Home is going to be sponsoring a gun buyback. And uh, it will be held at their lot on Washington Street from 9 a.m. till noon. And they'll be providing giant gift cards uh, between $25 and $100, depending on what type of firearm you turn in. So, uh, again, that's going to be uh, Saturday, August 6th. Um, the chief of police wanted me to address a shooting that occurred back on June 12th in the uh, 2200 block of South Brack Avenue. A uh, resident of apartment building had an accidental, accidental discharge of his firearm and unfortunately struck the neighbor below. Um, the matter is being investigated by the Allegheny County Police and the District Attorney's Office to see if there's any gonna, criminal charges gonna be filed. And then uh, finally, um, last week, Swissville Police Department and Edgewood Police Department received the uh, Community Service Award from the Western Pennsylvania School from the Deaf. Um, that's all I have for you tonight. Great, thank you, Detective Corrado. Uh, yes, Ms. Scales. I just want to thank our Swissville Police for their professionalism and the work that they 
in the service that they provided in our Pride celebration and our Juneteenth celebration, everyone felt welcome and they felt safe. So I just want to reiterate my gratitude. Well, thank you very much. I'll pass that on to the uh, members of the police department. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wellhelm, code and fire report. Um, just a few things. Uh, first thing is I had a conversation with the resident of 7309 Florence Street. If you recall, we had that on a demolition list and we removed it because they had a sales agreement to purchase 7311, the vacant property next door. And uh, I was just informed today that they did not end up buying it. And she called and said, just tear the building down. And I said, well, it's not that easy because we've removed it from the whole mix. So I will get with Mr. Vachi tomorrow. Uh, well, Greg, not you, you're familiar with the property. So that's back on the list, but it's been removed from the clearances and the grants. So it's probably going to be a year or two before we get back to that because we just filed another grant application, which we probably would, would include 23's demolitions. Um, also, the firefighter that was injured at the Woodstock Avenue firefighter, we're hoping he's going to be back. He has a final follow-up on July 8th. He did not have to have surgery for his shoulder injury, so we're hoping that he gets back and he's um, healing well. Um, we also, um, I had received word that we have, uh, I wrote previously and have been notified that we're awarded a $37,000 grant for EMS equipment through the Office of State Fire Commissioner. Um, that will be used for various uh, replacement and updating of equipment that we already have. Plus, we're going to be adding a device, which is a very expensive. It's about fifteen thousand dollars. It's called a Lucas device, and it help. It it actually does the compressions for CPR on the individual, because under the new protocols, we're required to do those uh, work that patient for twenty minutes before we decide with medical command, meaning the physician, of whether or not we transport that patient. And as you can imagine, even with four or five people, anybody who's ever done CPR, you get exhausted very quickly. So 20 minutes is an extraordinarily long time. And nobody in the area has one except, I think, Medic 952. So um, that'll be a great device to add to our repertoire for assisting citizens. And um, last but not least, just to let council know, I'll be working with the fire committee in the near future. Um, we added five part-time firefighters a few months back, um, but we had um, one <clears throat> that stayed for a while part-time, who was our fire marshal that got hired by the borough of Crafton as their building code official. He has second baby arriving, so he had resigned completely. Uh, another part-timer had gotten a job with another department in Washington County, making several dollars more an hour there as a part-time firefighter, so resigned. He was one of the ones we just hired. And then we had another one who resigned who uh, moved out east to take another position, uh, allegedly a chief-level position somewhere out east. So um, we added five, but we're back down, down three. And um, I really don't have many applicants. It's becoming harder and harder. Um, I have recently had a meeting with the Western Pennsylvania Career Chiefs, and we were discussing this in detail. That's about, um, I don't know, there's probably about 20 or 30, 25 or 30 Career Chiefs from all over Western Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, we're all struggling in the same manner. Uh, it's very difficult to get part-time personnel anymore. So I don't know. We're going to try to keep doing the best we can. Um, you know, I've, I've come in and worked weekend and overnight shifts about 15 times so far this year in addition to my normal duties. And I, I don't want that to become the norm because it's too much time away from my family. Um, because I do it because I care about the minimum staffing for the safety level of the firefighters. Um, but that's it, that's all I've got to report. Okay, thank you, Chief Wilhelm. Uh, Mr. Batchy, why don't you take both the next two public works and uh, borough manager? I apologize, I have a lot. So I'll try to be brief on each one. Uh, first thing under public works, and this is this goes with the demolitions. When we did the demolitions, or, or not the demolitions, but the uh, legal clearance hearings for demolitions on um, a few at the end of March, we also included 2520 South Braddock, which, if you remember, burned a few years ago. And we did a legal clearance hearing last year, did but did not move forward for various reasons. So we did we redid the legal clearance hearing. No one came forward. At this time, we're going to move forward with soliciting bids on that. I've asked, uh, or actually proposals, I've asked um, 
uh, Mr. Ziskow to put together a short scope of work. Um, I believe it will be under the minimum bidding threshold, which requires three written quotes. So we were going to contact basically all the people who normally bid on these uh, demos, which is about five to seven different demo contractors, uh, send out the, you know, send out the scope of work to them and ask them to, uh, to bid on it. We have about $12,000 in escrow, um, and then the rest will be paid from the uh, capital fund. So that's the first thing under public works. Uh, second is a few weeks ago, we had an issue with the street sweeper, which is uh, took it out of service. It is still out of service. We are looking at the R sweeper. We have a rentable right now that's, you know, that we're doing the routes with. We are looking at about a uh, 60 days to get the sweeper repaired. Um, we priced a new engine at the, what the problem is, is the pony motor, which runs the whole sweeper outfit, the crankshaft cracked in half. Um, that rarely happens. It's not through anybody's fault because there's no maintenance of that area. I mean, we, you know, we change the oil twice a year. Um, as, as a diesel engine, you really only have to do it once. We do it in the spring and we do it. We typically take it out of service a week in, at the end of August and do it twice. Um, the, the company that's fixing it, they're looking at it is perplexed as to why it broke, but the vehicle is eight years old. We got a price on a new engine, and by the time you get the engine, ship it here from Japan. Um, the uh, pay the pay. There's a there's a five hundred dollar entry fee plus a core charge. We're looking at about twenty thousand dollars for a new engine. We found a place in Ohio that can rebuild it uh, for about six thousand um, dollars. So that's the route we're going to take and save the money. Either way, it's it's about a the um, the rebuild's about a forty five day turnaround. They said that the um, uh, new engines about 60 days out if we order it today. So we'll save money on the rental and also on the, you know, on that. So, but it's something we need to look at here in the next year or two is maybe replacing or upgrading that sweeper because it is eight years old. I mean, it doesn't seem that old, but you know, these things are, are uh, happening to it and they are very extremely costly. Um, and the other thing too, is from a service standpoint, um, it's out of service a lot because of these issues. So it's something I'll, I'll be talking to the DPW committee here before the budget time, you know, and so getting their input and, and, you know, we'll look at pricing and such to see if that's something DPW committee wants to recommend and council wants to do. But we do have a rental sweeper right now, so we will be continuing the, um, the routes as, as normal. Um, Duquesne Light Company has, become, has began a changeover of, of street lights to LEDs. This was done with, uh, without them notifying the borough. They just began doing it when um, streetlights were, uh, were, were required the actual, the actual whole head to be replaced due to malfunctions. They've just come in and started replacing them with, um, with the LED lights. Had some complaints on Lomont Drive and from a resident there because he says very bright in his bedroom. Duquesne Light offered to put a shield on the back of it um, to keep the light off the, off the property and keep it in the street. Uh, they, but they want to charge $250 to do that, to put that, that shield on there. I had a conversation with uh, someone at Duquesne Light and asked them if they would be um, reducing our electric bill for the lights. And they said, oh, absolutely. It'd be 50 cents to a dollar cheaper. When everyone knows that, and anyone knows anything about LED technology knows it's about 85% less to run. So I've asked why we're not receiving, why we're receiving basically a two and a half to 5% decrease when um, the cost, their cost is dropping by about 85%. So they are, they said that they will get back to me. Um, that was about two weeks ago. I haven't heard back yet, but uh, I will be following up on that. Um, but if you see different lights, you know, like with brighter white light going out to actually a smaller head than the, the new, than the current lights. Um, but what they said within the next three to five years, they will do a planned replacement of all street lights in the borough with, with LEDs. We currently pay about $141,000 a year to Duquesne light for, um, for street lighting, uh, electricity. So it would be nice to see a reduction in that being their costs are, their costs are dropping dramatically. They need to, to pass that on to us. Um, and the last thing, fourth thing under public works, um, we, we had replaced a traffic signal at Waverly in South Braddock, the whole Arby's intersection, Arby's and Valero there a couple of years ago with an automated red light enforcement grant. That's money from Philadelphia's automated red light enforcement that is distributed throughout the state for these types of projects. Um, 
the the granite period that closes tomorrow for applications. Gibson Thomas Engineering, who did the engineering for us on the last one, contacted me and asked me if if they would like me to like them to, if I would like them to submit another grant application. And they said the focus of this year is on vehicle and pedestrian safety through PennDOT. So I thought a great one to do would be the intersection of Shoyer and Monongahela, because as we talked about numerous times, you know there are no pedestrian signals there, and it's kind of a blind intersection. You know when you come up Monongahela, make the right, make the left. Um, and the only thing we would have to pay for is possibly some of the engineering. Um, it would fund 100% of the of the installation of that. This is the one that I'm, I'm sorry to see that Sean had, uh, uh, had logged off, but this is the one that Sean brings up every now and then about there's no there's no pedestrian signs there. And these are antique street lights that are, or, I'm sorry, antique traffic signals at this intersection. So they're, they're, they're the oldest ones in Swissville. Um, so they are going to, they, they have submitted the grant as of today. Um, and we will know in the fall if we're, if we're funded for that. The last thing under public works is to address um, a couple of Ms. Ms. Spohl's comments. Um, she, she had asked, asked as she has many times about why are we working in, in other boroughs. And I just want to clarify that if we do not do the work in the other boroughs, if we stop collecting trash in Homestead and Chalfont, um, it, it doesn't give us more people uh, to do more projects in Swissville. We would have to eliminate one or two positions because those the the money that we that we receive from Homestead and Chalfont pays for two positions, um, and also it pays for you know we bought a third truck based upon the revenues that we received from Homestead. Um, we you know we pay those employees for the time that they work. And then there's, they're available to us the rest of the week. So the other three days that we don't collect in Homestead, we have three additional employees. Well, actually two, because one, you know, we took one off the crew and then added two for three days. But there's a net gain of employees um, for three days. And if we eliminate the revenue that we receive from them, which is, I think we bill them around two, a little over $230,000 right now annually, we would have to eliminate those people that pay, that are paid, those salaries are paid out of there. And then plus we make a profit off of them, which goes toward the general fund, um, goes toward balancing the general fund, which if we eliminated the profit we received from Homestead and Chow Fund, uh, we'd have to raise taxes about a third of a mil to cover it or, or eliminate that, that amount of services in the borough. So, you know, these, these enterprise things like this, you know, they, they do make us money and they do provide um, more staffing to us. Um, like I said, it's, if, if we eliminate them, we don't have a mechanism to fund two employees. So we would have to eliminate two employees. It wouldn't give us two more employees on the streets in Switzerland every day. Uh, the other thing she had mentioned um, is, is that the, the departments must work together. And I'm not sure what she's, um, what she's talking about and saying that we're not working together because uh, myself and Chief Wilhelm and Chief Watson all work very well together. And when we need something from one another, uh, we get it. Um, when I was, when during uh, COVID last year, when I had several drivers off, um, Chief, Assistant Chief Volpe drove the recycling truck a couple of days and drove the garbage truck one day because he has a CDL, he, he does have a CDL. And I, you know, I talked to Chief Wilhelm and asked if he would be, he would entertain that. And he said, certainly. Um, and, you know, talk to Mike and Mike come over and, and he drove the, he drove the routes for us so that we can continue to provide the services to the residents. Um, when I need something from chief, um, from chief Watson, you know, we take care of each other. So we, we, we do work well together. Um, and you know, that's, you know, something I want to continue to foster, especially when we bring in new public works director next month and new finance director, you know, so we're all working in harmony. So that's all I have under public works. I see Ms. Salisbury has her hand yeah. raised. Perfect. I was going to ask you to pause so she can respond or ask her question. So once a year or so, I like to ask if we can ever remove the shrubbery from the Shoyer and Monongahela intersection. That makes it impossible to see around the corner when you're driving from South Braddock down Shoyer um, toward Monongahela. I have a... Not, oh, sorry. I have a decent size SUV. It's not a giant one like our mobile command centers that we have for the borough, but it is a uh, you know SUV that puts you up pretty high. I still can't see around that corner. So um, 
this is like year number five of me asking if we can ever do anything about that, put a mirror or cite whoever has it there. I don't know who owns that house um, because it really, I think it is dangerous. You know, I've had a situation multiple times where I think it's clear and I try to pull forward and then somebody comes shooting around there because when you come up Monongahela from the parkway, you don't have to um, stop. You can just go to the right there. And I think it's really dangerous. So I would say like once a year or so I bring it up or Sean brings it up or we both bring it up and then I make a Monty Python joke about a shrubbery and then I never hear anything about it ever again. So I just wonder if there's anything that we can ever do about that. Well, it's, 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 there's nothing public works can do about it. I mean, we can't just go on the property and cut it out, as we mentioned before. But I think you, maybe you just hit on something, and, I, and we haven't, I don't recall discussing this before. Maybe there's a two-pronged approach here. Maybe we install a mirror on a pole there. I'd have to look to see where, you know, where the closest pole is, but maybe we can install a mirror, but also amend the ordinance on the stop sign that, to make that a, a two-way stop sign there. Um, because right now it's a one-way stop at when you're coming down shore, you have to stop when you approach Monongahela. Coming up Monongahela, if you're making a right, you can continue. And then coming down shore, you, there's no there's no stop movement at all. If we eliminated the the right on the, the, the continue, the traffic um, continue without stopping, that may improve the situation. Now we're going to have to put up some extra, some um, temporary signs there. To, you know, to, to tell people that, you know, somehow to get people to understand that that no longer exists. We can't just remove the sign because, you know, people are going to just run right through it. But maybe that's the pro the approach we could take, um, you know, is to change the traffic pattern there and also install the mirror. What's yeah, because I go out of my way to not have to go down Shoyer from South Braddock because it is a dangerous intersection. And I know somebody who lives at that corner who tells me that there's a lot of profanity that gets uh, shouted at that intersection throughout the day because everybody's mad because people don't know that the opposing traffic doesn't stop. People can't see around the corner. So you kind of have to like turtle your head out and see and like poke forward. So to me, I, I'm always amazed there aren't accidents there all the time because it just doesn't seem like a very safe intersection. Is that something council would be willing to, would be interested in entertaining to change that? I would. I, I would assume that there, there are uh, state laws having to do with vegetation blocking views at intersections. Um, I, think, I think that's correct, uh, Mr. Price. Yeah, there's some uh, uh, enforcement that I think the borough could potentially take. Yeah, we looked at this previously a few years ago. Actually, Bob, we had talked and we researched that Mr. Batchy was involved in it as well. We researched the PennDOT regulations and they apply to state roads, um, but normally local uh, governments have their own ordinances for line of sight requirements. We do for new development. Um, there is some in the zoning ordinance related to new development, but not to existing. Um, there's uh, a section for roadways and things like that um, for the construction of roadways. But the, the people, when of, Code enforcement has gone to the property owner various occasions over the last several years. Each time this has come up, they've cut back their shrubbery, but there's also a wall there too um, that it obstructs part of the view. So it's a structural element that's been there for, I don't even know how many years um, since I was a kid when I used to walk to Dixon school. So there's no current ordinance that we have that I can force them to remove that wall and the shrubbery that's been there predating the last, you know, I don't know how many decades, uh, but I'm open to it if there's a way that we can do it, but we've exhausted all of our means before. The people have been gracious enough to cut back the, there's a couple shrubs that get a little wild towards midsummer and they've cut them back before for us when we've asked them, um, but we didn't have any, you know, legal uh, way to force that at this point so it looks like you know there's a third option is that we could draft an, another draft an, an ordinance for line of sighted intersections you know and, and that might be the the most viable and you know easy and most economical way 
and I can tell you from our, our accidents that we've responded to there over you know my time and tenure here, um, the vast majority of the accidents have actually not been from the people coming out from the stop sign from that direction of Shoyer colliding with the person coming up Monongahela. It's actually been the people coming from the Monongahela Shoyer side colliding with the people coming up Monongahela because the, the people coming up, they don't have to stop or slow down and they just go wheeling around. And when you get some of these cars, larger cars and school buses even, had a couple school buses there, fortunately they've been empty, but they come and cut that corner tighter coming off of, you know, from the direction of Dixon School and they're making that left down Monongahela and the people coming up Monongahela because there's no stop sign, they just vroom, go right up and bam and ran into them. So. I got to be honest, the, the stop sign idea coming out Monongahela, I think would eliminate many of the accidents that I've seen and experienced responding to that were not a result from somebody coming out from the other side, but the majority have been from the other two directions. Sorry, my dog is yelling. I like that except right turn, but I, I understand if it would be for the safety of the intersection borough to change that ordinance. Does Weldy uh, have a comment? I see your hand up. Yes, but it's unrelated to the shrubbery. So I don't want to stop yeah. the pace on that discussion, but it is related to Department of Public Works. So sure. I'll wait for you guys to finish that to speak on Department of Public Works. Mr. Batchy, do you have what you need or do you need more of us to weigh in? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything. I, we suggested three options and no one's no one's weighed in as to which way you'd like to you'd like to go. So any of them that allows me to not um, have to turtle my car forward around the corner. Because if I can't see in an SUV, I feel like there's no way somebody can see in like a Toyota Camry. So whatever option is available, I'm happy with the mirror, the stop sign. Maybe let's start with the mirror, right? That seems to be the most least invasive and most cost effective. I would as guess. Long as, there's, as long as there's a pole to hang it As on. long as there's that a pole. And if, if there's not a pole or if that doesn't work, let's, let's uh, take we'll it up a notch. Next month. Sounds good. Okay. That good, Miss Salisbury. We can keep moving. Yes, I'm sorry. Right. I'm trying to keep my microphone off because my dog won't suffer. That's okay. It's all right. I feel like this is probably more progress than you've gotten the previous few times. So, step by step. All well, right, Miss Scales. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Price. Did you have something else to add? I was just going to say the other thought would be to reclassify shrubbery as running bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go. Um, all right, let's go, Miss Scales. Yes, I just wanted to mention to Greg that I am very um, impressed by the work program for our youth with Department of Public Works. There's been a couple of times that I've had to go to the borough building in the morning and it just really rejuvenated or started my day to see the kids because they're, they're very excited to be working and making money and to see them around the building. And even my husband mentioned he saw one of the youth just like skipping, hopping, smiling, walking to work. Um, so I just wanted to thank Greg for going the extra mile to figure out how to make that work because it is making a difference for our youth. And I, for one, am enjoying it. And I'm getting a, a lot of positive feedback from our parent, from the parents who um, children are working for the borough this summer. <laughs> I will mention my daughter. <laughs> my daughter says she'll cut grass, but I know she's not going to be a good employee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for going the extra mile. I really enjoy seeing the Welcome. kids out working. Great. Thank you for the comments. All right, Mr. Batchy, why don't you go ahead and uh, put your other hat on for borough manager? Sure. Um, first thing I have is borough building update. One of the things we talked about a couple months ago is every month I would give an update on the progress on the borough building. So um, the, borough, the building committee did meet uh, several weeks ago, maybe almost a month ago with CORE and with Lennon Smith Solar Engineers. And, you know, we talked about the work program, timeframe and everything. Um, 
there were there was a preliminary sketch given to us that was similar to the one that we used for the grant application. Uh, we talked about some additions to it, such as the tax office um, and a few other things. They have provided me with a revised plan, which I, I will be sending out to the building uh, committee tomorrow um, for your review. And if, if you're satisfied with it, there was some a uh, little bit of change as far as rather than it being a big box, they shifted it a little bit. Um, so it's like just like offset a little bit to help with the handicap access from Roslyn Street and South Braddock, as well as that to help with the internal access um, from the lower level to the upper level um, for the public to come in so they, they can come in both ways and not have to walk through the entire building. It would limit them to a couple secure areas until they are led into the areas where they need to go by the, by the staff. So I'll send it out to everybody tomorrow as it's on the building committee. And then once the building committee looks at it, we'll send it to all the council and then we'll, you know, we'll get back to the architects so they can continue. Um, so we have that done. And then the, the, um, the engineers, civil engineers, Len and Smith Sulray have come in and done all the survey work they communicated this morning that the, uh, the the topography work was done. All the utilities have been located. The property lines have been located, and they are waiting on the drill rig to get in there and do the core borings. And once that is done, that will wrap up the first component of their their package. And they also have to do the phase one environmental study, which I mean it's been a built a borough building and next to an apartment building and a couple houses for 100 years. So we don't expect to find anything in the phase one environmental study because you know it's the, the use of the property as of the Burr building property has not changed. And the couple vacant lots that we own next to it, you know, they went from residential to a parking lot. So we don't expect much of an issue there. So that's, that's the Burr building update. Um, number two, uh, Washington Street Bridge update. Norfolk Southern did hire an engineer to uh, prepare plans for uh, for some emergency repairs to the building, uh, to the building, I'm sorry, to the bridge. The bridge is controlled by the PUC because it's a railroad, even though it's, a, it's for traffic, pedestrian and vehicle traffic, it's owned by the railroad, so the PUC does oversee it. They have made a submission, a rather detailed submission to the PUC um, for uh, render some repairs to the bridge, structural repairs and um, improvements. This is not an overhaul of the bridge, you know, like, you know, like they did in the one section over the busway, but they would fix all of the holes in the, in the wearing surface, um, basically fix all the, you know, all the substructure underneath it so that we could patch, we could patch the wearing surface and there would be a lot of metal work uh, done on the bridge. They, I talked to Norfolk Southern about a week ago. They are trying to source the metal for it, and you know they're looking far and wide for it. Uh, and they said, you know, once they once PUC approves it and they get they're able to get the supplies, they will they will come in and, and start to work. They don't have a time frame on it because, of course, PUC, you know, until the PUC says says okay, then they can't then they can move forward. So they are they um, they did not ignore Senator Costa. When he got involved, and um, you know, Senator Costa really moved that forward. Uh, thirdly, we have um, last month we had talked about hiring a temporary worker in the uh, administration office uh, to assist. Um, we did hire a, uh, her name is Shatera Wilson. She's a Swiss Bell resident, lives a couple blocks from the borough building. She's been with us about two and a half weeks, and she's she's catching on really quick, doing a great job for us. So we're getting some of the backlog of parking tickets moved forward, you know, moving to citation. Um, Officer Ford um, has also been um, doing writing citations on the day she works. Um, you know, she's a part-time police officer. She's been doing a lot of citations, getting them filed with the magistrate. So we're getting a lot of this backlog of parking tickets from last year and this year. Um, process now that we do have uh, Shatera and uh, and then Officer Ford working with that. And before I get to the last thing, Bill, did you have a question? Yes, about the bridge. If they make these repairs, does this mean that replacing the bridge would be off the table? I don't know. Um, I, 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 I don't know, because it would probably be a long process to replace the bridge. So these may just be temporary repairs and then moving toward that in the future. But I, I don't know for certain. Because I do know that they want to bring double stack uh, container trains through 
mm-hmm. our region and right. this bridge is one of the things that's blocking that yes absolutely yeah and the last thing i have is is a response in response to Ms. spole's comments um about not not receiving um a response to her um to her email queries or inquiries on the website i know sarah's trying very very hard and i think she's doing very well at um responding to 100 percent of the um of the comments she receives uh on the website and then forwarding them off to the departments that you know that would uh, res- would that would address them if it was an issue with you know an infrastructure issue code issue or police issue or whatever and I would just ask that Ms. Spoles or anyone else that if you're if you are emailing the borough either via email or through the website and you're not getting a response, um, if it's going you know through to the administrative office or to the um, to the website, please call us and tell us that you're not receiving a response because maybe we're not receiving it. We did have a problem at the beginning with the directing uh, emails that and Ms. Spoles brought that to our attention. Um, that she, you know, she had sent several and received no response. And when our IT person looked into it, he found that there was, it just wasn't pointing certain emails to the right places. And we're pretty sure we addressed it, but if we haven't, please let us know. And, you know, we, because like I said, Sarah prides herself in responding to um, basically everything that comes through the office. So, um, you know, if there's not, if you don't get a response, please let us know. And that is all I have. Sorry, it took so long. Great, thanks so much for that, Mr. Batchy. Um, I'll be real quick for President's remarks. I just wanna give a big thank you to all council members, community members, staff members. Uh, I know there are many of you who worked tirelessly uh, over this past month for both the Pride and Juneteenth celebration. Um, and, and I just, just kudos to, to you all. I know um, a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into that. And it was just a great opportunity for Swissvel. I mean, to have both of these um, celebrations back to back, you know, just a couple weeks between them um, was great. And that's all I've got. Let's move to the solicitor's report. Uh, good evening. Just briefly, uh, council had directed uh, us to have a meeting uh, with Green Edge Technologies about potential parking for electronic vehicles. And I just wanted to report that meeting did take place on June the 7th. I think we it was very informative. There's still a lot of work to do. I know that Councilwoman Salisbury has been very involved in that and I'll probably be keeping council posted. But one of the things I was uh, very pleased about is they have some ideas on how we can get the utilities who supply the electricity involved in this. And um, that, that was a big step forward. So we'll, we'll keep uh, working on that and keep council informed in the future. And that's all I have this evening, thanks. Great, thank you, Mr. McTiernan. Uh, item six, any new business that anyone wants to bring up? Yes, Ms. Scales. So um, I equally want to just thank the community for their overwhelming support. Uh, Juneteenth was a success because of our community. Um, I wanted to just um, bring back to the members of council attention the monument request. For Juneteenth, we actually did raise proceeds to go towards that cost. We won't have a, a definitive answer in terms of what we have because we're literally still collecting at this time but um, at some point we're going to need to revisit the request to to match funds if there's not enough that was raised uh, to cover the cost. I I know that um, Angela and Josh asked for information on Mr. Point Dexter. I just want to make sure you guys got that information that I sent to you. So they that's not received it. Okay, perfect. Um, and then I also wanted to mention to Greg and Sarah, I know you guys got a lot going on, but help is on the way. Uh, we have a finance director and a DPW director coming. I'd like for us to revisit the recycle and, and trash can initiative that we started out uh, back with Katie. Uh, Because there was funding that was allocated, there was funds that even myself and Sean personally gave towards this uh, initiative, and we had to put a pause on it because we basically lost all our employees. So we're getting back to a fully functioning staff. I'd like to revisit this initiative so we can carry it out, um, if possible. 
Um, and then I just wanted to bring to council's attention so you're just not shocked when I, I, I request um, an opportunity to have a discussion on what does it take to um, for our local businesses with, to become women and minority owned certified with the city and the county. We, we have a, a process right now that when there's a bid opportunity, Greg basically puts it out to the WMBE and, and minority based organization. But there hasn't been an actual discussion on what does it take for uh, these businesses to become women and women and minority certified with the city and the county. And so I am preparing to have a discussion on that topic to inform um, our residents and also council as well, so that we can possibly get more community uh, engagement with the projects that we have right here in Swissville. And then I wanted to ask, because I know Greg brought this up before, we have a lot of these processes, but they're not actually codified in any sort of ordinance. So, for example, the process that we have with when there's a bid that he puts out to the WNBA and minority uh, organizations. Can we work on an ordinance that makes that a requirement that there's a certain percentage of minorities that are um, sought after for these opportunities with Swissville? We can certainly make that a goal. Um, okay. there, there are certain fields where it's hard to find, you know, like one, one specific area is traffic engineering. You know, there are very few traffic engineering firms and I, there are none that I'm aware of that are MBWB or DB certified. Um, so there are, there are just specialty fields like that where it's difficult, but as far as for construction goes, um, you know, we can put it in our bid specs that require, like when we build the borough building, you know, we can put it in our bid specs that we want 10% or 15% minority participation, um, you know, on the, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's the contractor or whether the employees or, you know, whatever, one of the subcontractors, you know, however they met, meet the goal, as long as they meet the goal and they prove that they meet the goal, you know, otherwise, um, you know, because the county does that on all, you know, on all their jobs, they have, I believe theirs right now is around 13%. The other they 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 seek out thirteen percent, um, my MB WB and DB and or participation, and yeah, we can certainly put that in our bid specs. Um, you know, for the for moving forward, there's a lot of things I've I've talked to Chris about, and I talked to um, Ms. Alfonso Wells also about you know getting in writing about hiring policies, bidding policies, you know, a lot of policies, you know, that we we kind of follow to the to the same. To the, to the you know the same way all the time, but um, once we get our DPW director in here and our finance director in here, that'll free me up to spend some time in actually drafting those policies and having council review them and formally adopt them and adopt. You know, we need to readopt the personnel policy manual because it's it's terribly outdated. Um, it's 20, 25, 26 years old, and it doesn't cover a lot of um, current legislation. You know that it has occurred. <coughs> excuse me, in the last twenty five years. Um, so we need to readopt that and just an overall policy manual, not necessarily for the employees, but how council operates with bidding. You know, when I say with council, how council operates, that means for bidding opportunities, for hiring of employees, appointments to boards and commissions, um, you know, and everything basically we talk about every month. You know, we can do that. And like I said, once I am uh, freed, freed up from some other roles, I, I want to jump into that. Thank you. Yeah, because I, I was elated that we were able to make that happen with the building uh, project. Mm -hmm. But now I want to go a step further to have that as an actual ordinance. So we don't know how long the three of us uh, for DAI are going to be on council or alive. So we'd like to see these initiatives remain in place right. even after us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We will do that. And that is all. Thank you, so, Chris. Sure. Actually, uh, Ms. Scales <laughs> jogged my memory on a few things. Uh, one is the newsletter should be coming out in the, the, the upcoming weeks. Um, I don't know if we have. Has it gone to the post office yet, USPS? No, it's at the printer right now. At the printer right now. So, But it's, it's coming. It should be coming sometime early July, early to mid-July. 
Uh, two things in there that I want to highlight. One references what Ms. Scales uh, talked about, which is the Darren Poindexter uh, Memorial, uh, that, that monument. Um, one of the things that we talked about at a previous meeting is creating kind of a, a, a fund within the borough for the, the donations that had been already collected to go to and a place that others could give to. So there is a, a little blurb in the newsletter about that. Uh, so the, the borough will receive, um, is willing to receive funds to continue you know, to support that. Um, just wanna make sure that that's clear. The second thing is on the front page, you'll see of that newsletter um, for all residents listening, um, an ARPA survey. Uh, we haven't talked about ARPA for a while, for several months, but there is a survey that is going to just kind of weigh some of the areas where residents would like to see that money spent. Um, it, it, is a, um, it will be a Google form that people can fill out online. Uh, if people do not want to fill it out online or cannot fill it out online, there are paper copies that will be available at the borough building and at the Swissville Library. Um, so just know that that is coming and there'll be, I think August 15th is going to be the, the end date for collection of those. Uh, and, and hopefully that can help direct us going forward so that we can actually spend some of this money um, or that we feel freed up to spend some of this money that, that the borough has, has been given. So thanks for jogging my memory for that, Ms. Scales. Any other new business? All right, uh, let's take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, all in favor, please say aye to adjourn at 944. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good, motion is adjourned. Mr. Price, enjoy your time in the office. That's what your background reminds me of every time. Good night, yeah. everyone. Take care.